Good afternoon and good evening to the rest of you guys. Welcome back to episode 34 of Bitcoin Magazine Live. And we're going to kick things off right away with Russia. Um, big news out of there. Putin moved the pawn to E6 and game theory is in full effect. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the back and forth nature of what Russia has been doing. We saw them originally try to ban cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular. You saw Putin talk about their competitive competitive advantage as far as how much energy they have. And now today they are going to legalize uh, Bitcoin. They are going to legalize cryptocurrency. I want to make a disclaimer really quickly. This does not mean it is legal tender. They're going to legalize it in the same way that other foreign currency is legalized in that country. And there is a, a big, big reason why. And you know exactly what it is. And it's taxes. They want to collect taxes however they can. We'll dive into the nuances of what's going on. But before we do, I want us to think a little bit big picture here. You have Russia, one of the largest countries in the world, one of the most powerful, arguably, in the world, definitely one of the more influential ones. And they have been very vocal going back and forth on their Bitcoin stance. You now have them, not only their leader, Putin, saying, we're going to move forward with this, figure it out, demanding that his uh, financial team, the financial branch of the government, as well as the lawmakers, come to terms and figure out how they can use Bitcoin going forward, then you also now have them coming out and saying, we're going to legalize it, but with little caveats here or there. On the global scale, every single country that views Russia as a threat, views them as a rival, or even if you view Russia as an, uh, an asset or an ally, you're going to look at this move and say, okay, well, if they, if they like it, there's a reason they like it. There's a reason they want to be involved in this what are, what are we missing? You, you have to be, I think, a little bit naive if you don't think Biden or someone in D.C. is sitting there reading and learning about Putin's move and thinking to themselves, what is it that they get that we don't? What is it that Russia understands about Bitcoin that we don't? Because if they get ahead of us there, we could fall very, very behind. And this is vitally important. It feeds back into the whole game theory that we talk about a lot in the Bitcoin community. You see one country make a move in a certain direction, and you have to now make the judgment of, well, if they're right, they're going to be days, weeks, months, years ahead of the curve versus, hey, if they do it around the same time as we do it, we keep pace with them. We're able to you know, keep as much Bitcoin as we have on our balance sheet. If that's, if that's the play that we're going for, we're able to regulate and keep an eye on what our citizens are doing with their Bitcoin. This is something that Russia is doing and we will dive into. Um, or it could be as simple as, hey, they're getting a new revenue stream and they have taxes coming in from Bitcoin. Why shouldn't we as well? So these are all things that Russia is talking about vocally. And these are things we should be conscious and aware of that are happening behind the scenes in closed door meetings. Uh, I would pay a lot of money to be a fly on the wall hearing what is being told to Biden about Russia, Bitcoin, and maybe even trying to get in his ear a little bit saying your advisors are probably wrong and we should move forward with Bitcoin in some capacity already. It's, we're falling behind the curve a little bit. Uh, Papa Joe, if you hear me, we're falling behind the curve. Russia is moving forward. We, we need to move forward with Bitcoin. So it is legalized or being pushed forward to be legalized. This will not come into effect until about the second half of the year or even possibly in 2023. So nothing necessarily set in stone. However, it is a step in that direction to legalize and start accepting Bitcoin. One of the key markers of this in not creating, not allowing Bitcoin to be legal tender is you are able to tax gains off of Bitcoin. Now, when it's legal tender and it's accepted currency as far as a country deeming it acceptable to pay your taxes and whatnot, gains, paper gains that you get in that type of a currency are negated as far as capital gains taxes go. That's why it was such a big deal when El Salvador introduced it as legal tender. You now have the opportunity to just benefit off of the gains you've made on Bitcoin without having to pay taxes on top of spending your money. I mean, the idea of having to pay taxes to spend your own money is ludicrous in a nutshell, but we don't need to dive down that rabbit hole yet. Um, so Russia is very vocal. We're going to collect taxes on Bitcoin, but how? 
how are you actually going to know that your citizens are using Bitcoin? How are you going to know how much they're transacting or what they're doing? Well, unfortunately, you are going to have to, if you are Russian, register it with the transparent blockchain system. And there's a caveat to this where Russia is only going to allow financial institutions that are accredited by their central government, uh, I shouldn't put the central government part in quotes, but you get what I'm saying. Um, essentially, the government's going to decide who can be a seller, buyer of Bitcoin as far as exchanges goes. But the caveat is you have to let us know who your clients are. You have to let us know who your customers are. That know your key, know your client, know your customer uh, push here in America that we fought back on, that a lot of these exchanges and wallet custodians have essentially said, no, we're not going to do it after the outcry that they saw on social media. Shout out to the Bitcoin community for seeing through a change that they wanted to see. I'm not necessarily sure Russia's citizens are going to be able to do it, nor do I believe necessarily Russia's citizens are really focused and able to, to make that push. Um, that said, I'm speaking as a naive American who doesn't necessarily know uh, people on the ground in Russia. Those of you in the comments, if I'm wrong, call me out on it. Let me know. Um, so we now have established that Russia is going to create this transparent blockchain system. You're going to have to tie your personal wallet to this. You're every single exchange that's going to be transacting Bitcoin legally in Russia, or at least in Russia's government's eyes legally, they are going to have to register their exchange and all of their clients' information with the Russian government to allow them to collect those taxes. This kind of negates the biggest benefit of Bitcoin, which is transacting your money without anyone sort of stopping you or telling you what to do. It, it again is, in my opinion, pure power grab. It is the last remnants of the fiat system and a fiat government trying to say, shoot, we are about to lose control of our money and finances. And if we don't control the money and finances, we're screwed. Um, please also, if you're watching right now, make sure you like and subscribe. Uh, we're going to be diving into Russia a lot today. We'll also be joined by fan favorite Nolan later in the episode. And we'll be joined with a special interview with Pleb. Uh, counselor himself, Dr. Jeff Ross, uh, excited for that interview as well. So make sure you stick around, make sure you hit like and subscribe. Um, and one quick sort of shout out update before we dive even deeper into Putin's mind. Bitcoin 22 is coming up. Uh, we will be in Miami from April 6th to the 9th. Heck, I'll be there a couple of days before and might even be there a couple of days after. Use code YTMAG. Make sure you're there. We got some exciting stuff coming up. Uh, there potentially is going to be a new panel announced later this week. You're going to have so much FOMO. You are going to have the most FOMO sitting on your phone, reading all the tweets coming up, seeing the posts that get sent about, oh my God, Jack Mallers just said what? Michael Saylor just said that on stage? Jack Dorsey just announced what? I may have spoiled something, but... Uh, <laughs> Make sure you get your tickets. Use code YTMAG, get 10% off. Ticket prices are going up next week. This is going to be, at this point, the cheapest ticket you can buy. So make sure you use the code before ticket prices go up. Now, back to Russia, back to Putin's mindset. So a couple of weeks ago, finance minister essentially said, we can't do Bitcoin. This is too dangerous. This is too dangerous. This is too sketchy. Putin turns around within 24 hours and says, we have such a competitive advantage as far as energy goes. I mean, the whole Ukraine uh, fiasco right now is enrooted around energy. Why do you think Germany is so concerned? If this does end up happening and Russia does invade Ukraine, their fear is that all of the energy that Germany gets from Russia will get cut off for a little bit or potentially forever, depending on if this is a full-fledged war. So Russia controls so much energy that Europe uses. Putin realizes this. Putin also realizes, as the laws of energy dictate, there is always energy wasted when energy is being used. And rather than continue to waste that energy, I think Putin is starting to see the benefits of capitalizing on this wasted energy. Comes out within 24 hours after his finance minister says, you know, Bitcoin ain't the thing. Actually, it is the thing. It is the thing for Russia because we have such a competitive advantage in energy. So figure it out. Now, they have essentially said, we're going to do this. We're going to take this out of a gray area and we're going to essentially turn this into some sort of a, a legalized currency. They're going to legalize it. Um, again, this does not mean it is legal tender. This is specifically going to be used to collect taxes and almost 
in essence, create some form of government overreach yet again that we see in another in industry that they have no business being involved in, only to continue to, I think, uh, entrench themselves in whatever way they see fit. Does this mean that they want to start collecting Bitcoin in taxes? Does this mean they want to just start holding Bitcoin while they start accumulating? That remains to be seen. They also haven't made any mention about mining. And I think that's going to be very important to see how they respond. Um, it will be interesting to see how they respond as far as mining goes, what decisions they make. Again, their competitive advantage is energy. Energy is most used and capitalized in Bitcoin for mining purposes. Uh, that's not to say that there are not other uses for energy within the Bitcoin ecosystem. It is just vitally important to recognize that I think the fact that they're sitting on their hands, the fact that they have not talked about mining in this announcement goes to show that they are, there is going to be something else and probably very well thought out. Does this mean they're going to try to, you know, force every single miner at any type they can to implement Bitcoin mining? Does this mean that they're going to have taxes and regulations on Bitcoin miners in the country? I'm not going to speculate. Uh, these are just two examples that pop into my head. We will just have to sort of wait and see. I think it will be very interesting, though, what the response globally off of Russia legalizing Bitcoin is. Does the EU or do countries in Europe take a response and stand and say, hey, we're going to move forward with this as well? Does the US respond? Does Canada respond? Um, it, it is going to be a very interesting few months. And I think in the, in the time leading up to Bitcoin 22, in the next two months, roughly, between now and when we're all in Miami, more dominoes are going to fall. This is game theory live. You essentially have one of the biggest countries in the world making a move towards Bitcoin. There has to be a response. As an American citizen, I want a response. I want the US government to tell me, what are you going to do? Because if you want to ban it, fine. If you want to say Bitcoin no more, you cannot have Bitcoin, fine. Just come out and say something. All press is good press. All news is good news. This is potentially good news for Bitcoin as far as through the Russian lens goes. I try to err on the side of maybe, like that old story of the Chinese farmer who continuously said maybe, regardless of at that present moment, something happening that could be deemed good or bad. This maybe is a good thing for Bitcoin. This maybe is a bad thing for Bitcoin in Russia. I think overall long-term, it is net positive we're taking steps in the right direction. But at the same time, it just remains to be seen what the rest of the world does. But this is a big step. The second layer of it is the mining response. You already have China having banned mining just south of Russia's border. Russia has the third highest hash rate in the world right now. So what decisions they make could very well impact decisions that China makes. The rumors circulating that China is gonna balk on their stance We'll see. Alex says Putin is the man. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe he intends to tax Bitcoin up to wazoo to a point where you're disincentivized to live in Russia and Bitcoiners in Russia have to leave. Or maybe the taxes they never are able to collect. And it becomes so difficult for them to collect those taxes that they just decide to ignore it. I doubt that, but there are so many possibilities that we can branch off to from this point. And all we know at this point is Russia intends to have Bitcoin a part of their country. In what capacity, we will continue to see as they make announcements. But don't, don't lose sight of the fact that within 24 hours, Putin negated what the finance minister said. I think so long as Putin is the one talking and Putin is the one making these statements and decisions, we can treat them a little bit more securely but that doesn't mean it's set in stone. This law doesn't go into effect until the end of the year or possibly next year. So that tells me it's still being written. Um, I do also want to highlight on the Russia front, on the Ukraine front, we talk a little bit and we will uh, also spend some time talking about the convoy up north. We talked earlier this week about GoFundMe sort of pulling the plug on them. Um, it is worth noting and highlighting that uh, Resistance in Ukraine has been collecting donations in Bitcoin as well. And they have been collecting donations, much like the trucker convoy up north for a different fight. But Bitcoin has been helping them get those funds because otherwise Russia is stopping and seizing money that's coming into them. 
we need to uh, continue to, I think, highlight and bring up what is going on uh, there without YouTube canceling our stream. But we will see. Time will tell. In the meantime, though, make sure you guys like and subscribe. We have 169 viewers right now. Nice. Uh, now we just went to 163. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we will have a big announcement coming up in a couple of weeks about our subscriber numbers. Um, I also want to highlight in regards to mining. Uh, yesterday, Valkyrie's ETF is officially listed uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. This is an ETF that has 80% of the companies in its pool or portfolio make a lot of percents, I know. So 80% of the portfolio is made up of companies that generate 50% of their profits through Bitcoin mining specifically. So that is sort of the guise and umbrella that this uh, ETF falls under. Huge, huge validation for Bitcoin mining in America now. So we're seeing Bitcoin getting legalized over in Russia. We're seeing Bitcoin mining get validated by Wall Street in America and frankly, globally, because so many people around the world trade and invest in our US New York Stock Exchange. You're starting to see game theory go into effect. Mm -hmm. It would not surprise me if we're, two, we're a few weeks away, maybe a month or so from Russia turning around and making their announcement about mining. We are watching step-by-step -step chess being played between all these global countries. Meanwhile, Bukele is down in El Salvador, just trolling everyone, keep buying the dip. Keep doing what you're doing, El Presidente. Um, keep buying the dip. Keep orange pilling other countries. We're looking forward to your announcement down in Miami. Hopefully this means a second country is going to introduce Bitcoin as legal tender. Remains to be seen, but you're not going to want to miss, miss it. Hammer Saw, you bring up a good point. However, I would argue that we have technically, technically been in a bear market. Uh, we're not at all-time highs, not on the NASDAQ, not on any index, nor are we at or near all-time highs on Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies for that matter. Um, so based on that, I wouldn't necessarily say the market is pumping. Uh, however, I do think it is valid to sort of digest the fact that this has happened. The market does look like it's correcting, remains to be seen. I still remain a little bit more bearish, but I always welcome being wrong in that regard. Um, I do also want to highlight some breaking news really quickly, and then we'll go back into a global scheme. But for those of you that missed it, the new iPhone feature is going to allow uh, Bitcoin tap to pay transactions. So no different than your Apple Pay when you go to a grocery store, you're now going to be able to have a Bitcoin card and you can pay with your Bitcoin. Um, that's awesome, especially if you are like my co-host who is secretly watching with all of you plebs in the chat. Um, if you're on 100% Bitcoin standard, you're probably transacting a Bitcoin from time to time, and that is a necessity. Uh, I myself still hold some fiat for the sake of not having to sell my Bitcoin, but that's a personal decision, and there's no right or wrong. I think the only wrong decision actually is a 0% allocation. That is truly the only wrong uh, position and allocation. As Greg Foss said to us a few weeks back, even 1% allocation sets you up big. If, if we're even... 50% right about what Bitcoin, even if we're 25% right about what Bitcoin can do, a 1% allocation is worth your time and investment. Uh, Hammer, so I'm going to keep talking with you because you are absolutely right. New stock listings are scary. They're dangerous. I don't like to touch them. It's why I laughed at everyone who bought the Coinbase IPO and then I watched it crash and crater. It's why I, I stepped away from... Um, Tesla, when it did a stock split, that's another thing to keep in mind. Stock splits tend to drive a stock lower and down because unfortunately, volume does not necessarily keep up as much on stock splits that historically have been more equal to or more than four to one or more. You, you watch Tesla do a five to one split and that stock cratered for about two weeks before it started its uh, incline yet again. You just had Google do a 20 to one stock split. Good luck with that. Anyone who holds Google, I wish you nothing but luck. Uh, be safe out there. Um, but Hammersaw, you're absolutely right. New listings tend to get overhyped. You're going to see a lot of news articles. This is the pump and dump in this equities market. So be careful out there. 
my uh, <laughs> my producer Chris, very smart move to also refuse the Coinbase IPO. Although shout out your buddy who tried to buy the Bumble IPO. Uh, I hope at least he got some matches, maybe. <laughs> um, another thing, just uh, we'll, you know me, I'm the equities guy, so we'll talk this for for a brief second. Um, another thing, just to keep in mind when it comes to um, just investment natures and, and understanding what IPOs are going on, pay attention to what firms have invested in what rounds, especially in the later rounds. If you if you see a, a seed rounds, oh, sorry, if you're in round C or later, you have to pay attention because those are the companies that are really focused on. We need to take this public because that's the only way I see a return on my investment. And there is a certain price point, both that they bought at that you have to understand and a price point that they're trying to list at. The market has been oversaturated pretty much since 2020, post the Fed printing nonstop. This is, you You are now seeing essentially almost every IPO, uh, throw it in the chats if there's an IPO that you can actually call me out on. Um, but the big, big money, big name IPOs that I've been tracking, paying attention to continuously end up listing at a price well above, well is it an exaggeration, but some of them are well above, most of them above the actual listed price when they go to the private markets and go to the bank. So by the time you and I can actually buy it on E-Trade, Robinhood or whatever platform you're using, none of those are sponsors, um, you're able to pay such a premium for it and then watch your IPO that you just bought crater very slowly and fat, or slowly and painfully. So I did my equities bit. We'll, we'll move right back over to Russia yet again, uh, because I, I cannot stress this enough. And I think, Chris, if we could throw on the game theory graphic for just a moment, I want to really take a second to like break this down for you guys, because I cannot stress this enough, how large of a move this is on a global scale. So... You have at the top left, both A and B are laggards because they don't buy, they don't adopt Bitcoin or whatever. Right now, let's use this top row is Russia, country A, Russia, country B, USA. We are now shifting to the buy column on the right of your screen. So country A has bought, but country B did not buy. A buys early, gets rich, B adopts late and can no longer accumulate competitively. Now let's take a step back because I know this says buy and Russia has not necessarily said they're buying or accumulating. However, we have to, I think, think bigger picture than just what's written or what is said. If you're going to collect taxes on Bitcoin, what do you think your citizens are going to be paying that in? Sure, some of them might pay in your currency. Some of them might pay in Bitcoin. And I don't think Russia or Putin is going to be mad about that. This is income that they don't collect right now. Keep that in mind. Like this is a specific tax created for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that just doesn't exist. So now you have a new revenue stream coming into a government because all governments in essence are just big business. So now you have a new revenue stream coming in that just didn't exist before. You will accept anything that comes in, even if it devalues 90%, as some of the haters will like to say, fine. Say you get 10% of this 30% tax. So you're collecting 3% only 3% on a 90% decline from when you collected those taxes in Bitcoin to where we are in this future scenario. With only a 3% gain in taxes, you are still moving your economy forward. You are increasing your GDP in a weird way. It's, it's nuanced. It's the fiat system. So it works for the country. It does not necessarily work for the citizen. This is also not the first country to introduce a 30% tax on Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. India just announced one last week, again, reversing their earlier decision of trying to ban and limit Bitcoin and cryptocurrency exchanges. As you continue to see these sort of bulk switching, I, I don't even want to call it flip-flopping because the truth is it is, and that's just too easy and too low-hanging fruit. I think it's genuinely being misinformed and showing growth and changing your mind. I want to give these countries the benefit of the doubt. I don't like politicians. I, I frankly do not enjoy 
there's not a single government that I can point to in the world and say, yo, they haven't figured out. They're oh, maybe, no, there's not a single country where I'm like, yo, your central government is the bee's knees, my man. Like I need to, I need to live there. Um, if we keep these, these type of things in mind and keep it through the lens of, hey, these leaders are actually growing and they're thinking about things in a different way, it sets us up for potentially continuing to change their mind about Bitcoin, continuing to change their mind and approach about how they lead, how they collect taxes, how they think about money, because that's what this really is. We don't think about money in the same way that a lot of these centralized powers do and do in large part because we really have started to understand what is sound money. Space Oddity, you are right. Russia has not decided. However, they have made announcements and those announcements impact the markets. They impact our decisions and they impact what other countries are going to decide. While no, it has not been written into law, it does matter. It is worth our time and it is worth paying attention to. I would be hard pressed and I would be very surprised if there are not announcements off the heels of this. I'm not necessarily saying another country is going to turn around and say, we're going to tax Bitcoin as well. We're going to legalize Bitcoin because Russia did it. No, no one's going to say that. You don't want to feed Putin's ego, but you're going to do it. You're going to make those decisions because it is in the best interest in your mind for your country's future, because essentially your competitor, your competitor is doing it. That is, government is just big business. It's just big business for the nation state. And they... They have their hands in, in different industries depending on what country you're in. Whether or not you agree with that, that's, that is what the system is. And so when other countries see, or using the business example, when other businesses see their competitor starting to do certain things, start to attract new clients, customers, they start to make a new revenue stream. Huh, why don't we do that? It's the same thing about legalizing weed in America. Okay, pot's legal down in Colorado, but it's illegal in Wyoming. Well, they share a border. So what, it, what do citizens of Wyoming who want to buy legal weed if they don't have access to it in Wyoming? Drive over the border. But the taxes you pay on that don't go to your home state of Wyoming. They go to Canada. If let's play the Russia-China game right now. No Bitcoin mining is allowed in China. No transacting of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies is allowed in China. I believe that is still the case. Correct me if I'm wrong. If all of a sudden Chinese citizens who have been exiting, coming to Austin, going to Kazakhstan, going to Iran, all over the world, those miners and operators are essentially figuring out new places to live. Well, now just over the border in a country like Russia, they're able to go. And now all of a sudden those tax dollars and, and the wealth that was in China gets shifted over to Russia, gets shifted over to the US. I'm sorry, but China is going to flip their stance. And I will give Putin the credit for doing that when it happens. Um, but that's my rant. I know some of you may disagree. Throw it in the comments. Let me know. We're going to be joined momentarily by Nolan to have another segment from him. It's going to be awesome. I always learn a ton. I hope you guys do as well. But before we break to a commercial break, I just want to remind you guys that the conference is going to be one of the biggest events in Bitcoin this year. Last year, it was the biggest event. Those of you who attended have, have shared stories and talked about how it has impacted you. It changed your life. It changed your perspective. It changed my life. I'm, I'm only here now because of my me attending the conference, putting myself in a situation, meeting people that I would have never met otherwise in person. Heck, we had Mark Moss on yesterday. I was sharing with him. I met you at the conference. I was like a no, nobody pleb at the conference. And I just went up to you while you were waiting in line for coffee to shake your hand. Like where else in the world are you going to get to meet all of your favorite followers on Twitter, all of the thought leaders in one space? Use code YTMAG, come out there. You're not going to regret it. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to have Nolan come on
Welcome back, guys. And I'm joined here by Nolan. Nolan, how goes it down in the Bahamas? Uh, Barbados. Barbados. Um, we love life. We love life every day. We, we, we continue to love life, right? We've, we've been lucky enough to understand the value of time for many years now. And we've been able to dictate what we do with our time. Really important thing, right? So we love our life. We love time. We love our time. We love our time here on the planet. And on this show, we love our relationship with money. We compare relationships that people have with money, either to fiat money or Bitcoin. And we contrast those relationships. So what we do is we take mainstream media news stories and filter them through either a Bitcoin standard lens or a fiat standard lens. And we come up with some contrasts and some conclusions and some results. And that's why we put this whole show in the context of a relationship and why we call it the breakup, because it really is about ending a relationship and starting something new. So mainstream media stories today. I got a really fun one to start off. Did anyone see Ryan Seltis on Tucker Carlson last night? Probably the most prominent uh, appearance by a Bitcoin crypto related person on any cable news show in the United States. So. Ryan Selkis was there to push his Digital Freedom Alliance, which sounds great. So congratulations to Ryan Selkis and everyone who's involved in that. It sounds like it could be a real help. There was another story on Tucker Carlson for those who might not have seen it, and it covered a guy named Mark Carney. Mark Carney. I worked with him for a little while, so I have a bit of insight here, and I'm going to share it for you today. So Mark Carney um, is probably the most prominent person of this clown world meme that we all talk about, and I'll explain that in a second. I also come up with some remedies on how to deal with this guy, so stay tuned for those. But first, what did he do? Why was he on Tucker Carlson last night? Right. So he was on Tucker Carlson last night because he wrote a story for a newspaper called The Globe and Mail. So if you don't know what a newspaper is, it's like a paper thing, and they've got news stories in it, and you can read them all, and it's supposed to have them all for the day. And, and so he, the biggest, one of the biggest ones in Canada is this thing called The Globe and Mail. And, and so he wrote an article for the Globe and Mail, and I'll read you the title because it's amazing, right? It's time to end the sedition in Ottawa by enforcing law and following the money. That's what we do on the show. We follow the money, right? We like to follow the money. Who's got the money? Why do they have the money? Where does it come from? So Mark Carney says, follow the money. Now, who is Mark Carney? Why is he writing the Globe and Mail? And if you don't know about Mark Carney, let's do a quick lesson on Mark Carney. So Mark Carney used to be at Goldman Sachs in the early 2000s. Then apparently he saw a job offer in the Economist magazine to be the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada and wrote in and they're like, who's this guy? He's great. Let's give him the governorship. So he became the governor of the Bank of Canada. And that's where I intersected with him. So in the Senate Banking Committee where I worked, he took his position as governor of Bank of Canada right during the financial crisis. And Canada sort of came out really well of the 2008 financial crisis. And a lot of people look to Canadian banking as a, an example of how to avoid the excesses of the American system. So it became sort of a, a, a really cool, prominent, hip thing to say, oh, wow, conservative Canadian banking really got it right. And so he became sort of the poster child for this in this governorship position. We would ask him a lot about what he was going to do for the Greek debt crisis at the time. And, and the members of the committee took it seriously. And he's super uh, articulate, you know, really can speak precisely about things. So he would have to come statutorily to the committee twice a year and give his economic update. And we would all, you know, I, I would help craft questions for the senators. Um, within that job, he ended up taking over the presidency, presidency of something called the BIS. That's the Bank for International Settlements. It's a Swiss central bank set up after World War I to be the central bank of central banks. So the banks themselves need a bank account, right? So I told you when I worked with Kraken, I helped like set up their like account with the Federal Reserve. Not help set it up, but scope out what it was, right? You know, I got the the client manual, like this is how you get onboarded into the Federal Reserve. That's absurd, right? But the central banks also have a bank. I haven't seen their UX UI, but it must be something else. So the BIS is in Switzerland, and he became the chair of that as well. And then from there, he was such a celebrity that they made him the um, uh, exchequer, I guess they call it, but it's kind of like the chairman or it's kind of like the Jay Powell president of the Fed position, but for the Bank of England, right? So he left Canada to go to the Bank of England, sort of an upgrade situation, right? So this Canadian guy came in and became the governor of the Bank of England. So he did all these things. 
what he was really known for in all of these efforts and why they kept him around so many years is because he was in charge of something called the Basel Three Accords. The Basel Three Accords are a series of agreements between all the major banks in the world. And this was getting worked on when, when I was, you know, when he was at the Bank of Canada and, and I was on that committee working as a researcher. And, and so this stuff came through all the time. The point of Basel III, you know, just the, the TLDR of it, banks have to have money so they don't have a run in the bank. They have to have capital requirements, right? That's the, the main gist of it. They need capital requirements and liquidity provisions so they don't do what the American subprime mortgage situation led us to, which is lend out too much money. And then theoretically, you could have a run on the banks. So they set up this whole big reporting system, right, to prevent any form of collapse of this system. So he's a major architect of all banking regulatory infrastructure. <clears throat> Since he left the Bank of England a few years ago, he went to the COPA 26 or 7 or whatever. It's some kind of environmental agreement where they you know, bring all kinds of uh, policymakers together and sort of decide on where to invest, what to invest in for environmental stuff. He was also the UN um, like negotiator for this on the part of England. So they sent him to be like their UN environmental investment guy. And then he went to an asset manager as well called Brookfield Asset Management. So they've got about $500 million, billion, ugh, $500 billion. Hold on, all of these prefixes are going to be important in a second. $500 billion in assets under management related to uh, green energy stuff, you know, wind, solar, hydro, all that kind of stuff. He's also a writer of a book called Values, and they put the S with the thing on it. That came out last year, right? Value. And he also wrote this article in the Global Mail. So these are, this is what his career, this is, this is the career span here, right? So Basel III, all of these prominent institutions, Goldman Sachs, Bank of Canada, Bank of International Settlements, Bank of England. It's pretty good. COPA 26 or 7, I don't really remember. And he went, let me tell you about this thing here. They, they just got this deal settled last November. Now, remember what I said the prefixes would be important? They put together a financing package for ESG investment involving private sector participants, central banks, uh, and, and large institutions. The number that he got allocated to ESG investment in the future as chair of this thing is 130 trillion. 130 trillion. Okay, that's what he got agreed to at this COPA thing in, in November and through the UN and through the Brookfield deal, right? That's his new job. $130 trillion, right? To manage on ESG investments and all that stuff, right? So, so that's his background, right? So he sounds like a pretty tough guy. Like this is, if we're talking about the final boss in the bank world, I don't know, like he's pretty close, right? He's got all this stuff. So we should be pretty worried about what this guy has to say, right? He's amazing. Like he's got everything. I mean, he's telling you here that I'm gonna prevent a run in the banks through my rules. I'm gonna preserve the banking system. And then not only that, he's going to, and, and the stated value, the stated point of that book values is that all financial decisions he believes should go through this environmental matrix of decision-making, right? So we put that together, like literally every decision. So he will prevent a bank run and will recalibrate all financial decisions so that ESG is taken into account so that the economy can produce the results that we're all looking for a healthy, positive world, right? So, but, you know, at the same time, he's writing this article in the, in the, in the Globe and Mail, follow the money and is saying that the people protesting in Ottawa, we should actually look into their accounts and, and seize their money and, and stop it, right? We, we should stop them from having money because they're breaking the law, right? So, so when you hear about him saying that stuff for the environment, he's, he sounds even scarier, right? He sounds like, whoa, this guy is the puppet master, right? He is the puppet master. So should we be afraid of this guy? Is he, is he you know, the, the final boss? Well, I mean, I don't think so. And I'll tell you why. Let's look at his let's look at his resume again and find out. Let's do it one more time. But let's put the filter of reality on top of his resume. Let's not use credentialism. Let's not use the 130 trillion press release. Let's not talk about the 500 billion in ESG for a second or the Basel three, of course. Let's just look at his resume one more time, but with another filter of reality. All right, the preventing the bank run, Basel III Accords. That's the summary of the work that he did all these years, right? 
All right, well, guess what happened with the Basel III accounting awards? Guess what happened to that? Well, COVID happened. There's no Basel III. It's not happening this year. It's not happening next year. It's not happening the year after. They've pushed it down to 2028 now for the banks to report on their capitalization and liquidity requirements to have it public and so we all know, right? Is that gonna happen? Is 2028 gonna be the year that we finally get to Basel? It was supposed to be three years ago, then COVID happened, right? It was supposed to be last year. It was supposed to be this year. My whole thing to end Mark Carney, right? My whole thing to end Mark Carney really is to give him what he wants. He said he wanted Basel III to prevent a bank run. Well, what happens if he does it? Are we gonna have a bank run? Probably, that's why we haven't had it, right? So whether we do or don't run Basel III, it almost doesn't matter. Mark Carney is gonna be there as the person responsible for the mechanism that will either cause the bank run or delay the bank run, right? There's a way to look at it that way. Now, what about all this ESG environmental stuff, right? The 120, 130 trillion, he wrote a, a speech that was published called 50 Shades of Green, the ESG thing. He's got the Brookfield, all that stuff, right? Now, the new risk management matrix that he put in this book, Values, right, has new valuations about tilting and pushing and rewarding businesses for going carbon neutral this much or not that much, and then you punish them. It's this whole new system, right? So what's he really saying with this whole new system? Well, let's look at what Values is, right? I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in his own words. He says that markets and the, the, the tension in markets was an old form of consensus. It's an old form of consensus. He unveiled in his book his new form of consensus so that all our decisions can be made according to his matrix. Listen to what they are. These values he believes will drive individuals, businesses, and governments to make better decisions. These are the values. He thinks this is going to be consensus from now on, right? Consensus is solidarity. It's fairness. Give me an ounce of fairness. It's responsibility, right? Resilience, sustainability, dynamism. I think that's how you say it, dynamism. Humility, right? All of these elements he thinks are going to be the things we use to measure markets, to measure energy, and to allocate the $130 trillion that has been given to his nebulous order, right? So. He's going to get $130 trillion. He's going to run it through this matrix of solidarity, fairness, responsibility, resilience, sustainability, dynamism, and humility. And then that's going to take over Wall Street metrics. That's going to be the new way we measure values, right? So that's the new way. So he has this big plan. He's got all this money. But what's actually going on here? Let's look at the record of these companies, Brookfield, right? What's in Brookfield's $500 billion of stuff, right? Their, their ESG thing. Well, they've got 70 gigawatts of green energy, 70 gigawatts. What is that? Do you know what 70 gigawatts is? It's like a couple of Bitcoin mines. So for $500 billion, they got a couple of modest big Bitcoin mines. All of Bitcoin is in the, 100 terawatt realm, right? It wouldn't even like, if he took all of Brookfield Asset Management, they could be a bit of a competitive miner. I don't, I don't think they'd compete with Foundry or the other largest pools, but they could, they could be around, right? They got a lot of acreage though. You could put on paper that's worth $500 billion if you count the farmland, the companies and their balance sheets and all the other stuff that's there, eh, it's 500 billion. How much does he have in nuclear? I don't know, it's actually zero. They have Westinghouse, right? Which is making a small modular nuclear reactor, but they're trying to sell it, right? They don't want it anymore. Uh, yeah, uh. Not as much of the sustainability and all the other stuff that they're worried about, right? So they want the wind and the solar, not the nuclear. Was there a single word in anything he's written in the 50 Shades of Grey thing? This book that he wrote, uh, Values, is 608 pages. In 608 pages about what the future economy is going to build on, did he ever mention nuclear energy one time? Ever? No, 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 never, never, never. It was a bunch of decisions that we have to make in order to avoid global warming because blah, 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 blah. So my argument remains, if you give this guy everything he wants, make him, let him have it, right? Let him have it. Let him have Basel III, make him successful in that first career. And you can really see the progression of, of the central bank career here. He went from monetary policy guy to literally every single policy on earth guy, right? That, that's what happened. He went from monetary to everything. Like I want all your financial decisions have to run through this. 
And if you go to Ottawa and protest, well, your bank is going to get shut down, right? So last night he was on, as I said, Tucker, right? He's got 42,000 Twitter followers. Ryan Selkis has 242,000 Twitter followers, right? So the guy with 42,000 Twitter followers, who I might add, had his book come out on a day that I was producing a show around uh, crypto last year, all kinds of people involved. And I said, the book's coming out that day. And I wrote to his publicist. I said, hey, you know, maybe you want to come pitch your book to our large audience. And what did he say? I'm a little busy. So I got to say, well, have fun staying poor because your book about whatever the future and you don't mention Bitcoin. Oh, well. And then you also don't mention nuclear energy, right? So here's the thing. I worked, I worked in a retirement home when I was a university student. I went, it was a great job because you got to go at lunch and at dinner and you got a big break. So the, the seniors would come down to like a dining room. They would dress really nicely, you know, suits and ties actually every night. We'd give them their tea at night, feed them their plates. You know, there was a couple of cooks and then there was a boy and a girl, me and this girl. They wanted a boy and a girl server. They're delightful people. They're all 80, 90 years old, right? But there was a fella there who was probably only in his 50s and he'd come and talk to this really rich old 90 year old lady, right? He was kind of like a confidence man, right? He was running a confidence man scheme, right? He was trying to get friendly with her and get that money, right? That was the whole, I mean, everybody working there knew it. She probably knew it too. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to mind read her, but my feeling is she understood exactly what was going on. But he was one of these guys, you know, in his 50s, trying to rip off an old lady every day, working at it gently, right? Every day. It's a confidence scam, right? Every day, saying the words she likes, da 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 da. Here's the thing about Mark Carney. I once met him outside of office, right, in Parliament Hill, right where those protests are going right now. And he still had his makeup on from, you know, he just wears makeup all the time. He's on TV a lot. I did a lot of TV in New York and I wore makeup. So I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Sometimes you just leave the studio and you still have makeup on and you don't notice, right? But that makeup look and the way his eyebrows are trimmed and all the other stuff makes me think of a confidence man. I can't unsee it, right? And especially when I look at the way he's taking this $130 trillion and who gave it to him, right? It's the pension plans. It's all the people that want to hear and actually believe the human mind and Wall Street will be dictated by fairness, humility, and all these sustainability and all these other dynamism, right? Only someone running a confidence scam on some senior citizens could ever think this makes sense, right? That, that, that we're literally going to change the risk assessment of Wall Street to wishy-washy words, right? Is that ever going to happen? There's a non-zero chance probably even likely that Mark Carney becomes the greatest financial loser in the history of the world. No one could lose more money than this guy. If you add it up, if you add up the delay, the push and the pull, what are we doing with banking? Did we ever respond to the 2008 crisis? What about Basel III? What about the banks? What about liquidity? What about a run of the banks? I don't know. Can we do it? Can we not do it? COVID, we're not sure. Repo market, I don't know. That's where they're at on that, right? That's, that's his whole legacy on that end. So that wasn't really well managed, right? What happens? We'll see. The other part, the $130 trillion of investment for ESG, but what about nuclear? Well, what happens if Bitcoiners buy all these small modular nuclear reactors and they're all over the world, and then no one ever has to think about values with the S and this whole matrix on how to get money into ESG? What if the $130 trillion is just a loss? It's just a loss because they, they bet on the wrong thing. They bet on a stupid color, green, right? They thought, oh, green's going to come in. We're going to make money. Great. Everyone's going to think like Mark Carney now, right? But what if Mark Carney's wrong? What if he's wrong? I think he's wrong, right? If he's wrong, then he becomes the greatest financial loser ever in the history of the world. And all we have to do is give him what he's asking for. That's it, right? Give him what he's asking for. All right, Mark, give us Basel three. Let's see what happens one way or the other. Will the banks, will there be a run in the banks or not? Will your thing work? I want to know. I want to know if it's going to work, right? Is it going to save the banks from a run or is it going to cause the run? Let's find out, right? The next part, the ESG piece, right? What happens if nuclear means no one cares about your stupid values and your stupid new matrix for risk assessment and value investing and all that stuff? What if that doesn't catch on? Because I have a feeling it ain't going to catch on, right? No one's going to go. I don't hear anyone on Wall Street saying, I got to redo my whole 
you know, system here. I got to figure out what's going on. I got to put in Mark Carney's factors of sustainability and, and all this stuff at the tilt and the push and all that. What if I don't do it? Right. So if you think about Mark Carney in these terms, what do we need to do to beat him? We got to buy nuclear reactors. We got to make nuclear a thing and we got to make Bitcoin a thing. Those two things happening, pretty good chance of happening, pretty good chance at this point of happening would make him the greatest financial loser in the history of the world, bar none, not even close. There, there wouldn't even be a way to measure it, right? It'd just be the greatest loss ever. So if you're worried about which side to go on, right? What's going on? Mark Carney says, Ottawa, we should hunt these people down. Right? And they say that he might even be the next leader after Justin Trudeau. I mean, he's never going to win, right? You would literally need to, to cheat the whole election for this guy to win because Globe Mail isn't going to do it, right? His, his 42,000 Twitter followers is not going to cut it, right? It's not going to happen. And then he's going to go and pull this change in Wall Street metrics. So from where I'm sitting, Mark Carney, not the guy to follow, maybe the biggest financial loser of all time. And it's a shout out to the bowtie bull folks who always say that banks are zeros. There couldn't be a bigger one than this guy. So he might just be the chief clown. And I want to just underline my last point on this. When we think about the simulation. We think about clown world. You know, the simulation delivers just beautiful things to us. Isn't it amazing that the guy who runs the clown world is actually named Carney? He's a Carney, that a Carney runs clown world and might be the guy responsible, the poster child for the end of clown world. Carney, the poster child for the end of clown world. It might work, it might hit, it might actually fit. So there you go. That's today's episode of The Breakup. Awesome. Nolan, thank you for that. I mean, I think the, the big takeaway from this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the closer you are to the money printer, the more you have to lose. And the decisions that those who frankly control said money printers is going to impact all of us in more ways than just the fiat currency. Are you, are there other people of this ill? I mean, we talk a lot about Powell here in the States, are there others you're looking in the same vein as Carney on a global scale that we should all sort of start knowing these people's names? Well, Carney, Carney for sure. Um, I can't really think of any that stand out like he does. Uh, he's, he's a particular, you know, the, the, big, the big guy, like I don't want to do any of the fat shaming, but you know, the guy in Europe, he's, he's really heavy. We see his picture all the time. Oh, the, I don't the, know much about him, but that's the European bank thing, right? I think they're already done. Like, I don't think there's much about Augustine Carlson. Yeah. Powell, Powell's only really, I mean, he's not even an economist, right? Powell's not. Well, he's a, a lawyer. Exactly. He's a lawyer. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, it's not the same as, as, as what, what I'll say is this. I don't think there's anyone out there with as much cognitive bias as Mark Carney. Because Mark Carney probably thought that letter to the Globe and Mail was a good idea, right? Probably thought, like, I'm going to be prime minister, I'm going to go flex in a major newspaper, and people are going to say, wow, leadership. Yeah, yeah, they got, you know, 20,000 people reading it or something. You know, it's nothing. Like, there's, there's nobody there, right? But if you're from that old world, and you're running a grift, a confidence scheme on old people, and they're all falling for it because he went to Harvard and he was the captain of the Cambridge or the Oxford or whatever hockey team, you know, all these things, you can impress them a lot. So in this case, I, I think he's even sincere. I think he really thinks he can change the world. He, you know, if, if, I, if I'm going to mind read him for, some, for a second, he's the guy who looks at Bitcoin and says, I can mine it with my brain. You know what I mean? I could just, I could just go and mine this thing. You know what I mean? Like, because he's, he's a smart guy, you know what I mean? Like, like I'm just talking raw horsepower, right? <clears throat> just raw horsepower. So when I, when I think of him and all the positions he's been in, to me, the, the blindness comes from being so good at, at what he does. Like, I, I mean, I, I think he really believes he can prevent a bank run. I think he thinks, he, I think he thinks that, right? I think he, he's able to make enough conditional understanding that if, if you engineer it this way, if this and this and this and this go right, it'll work. The problem is it's not based in reality. It's like the, the thing with the ESG and changing your matrix for risk management and changing your system for valuation. 
I recognized him because I had a job working in a retirement home. I don't think he ever had a job working in a retirement home. I don't think he ever had a job that took into account human behavior. There is no human who is just going to change their operating system because you put it in a book and it's going to be good for the environment in the end. Right? No, no one's going to do that. Like Bitcoin admits that we're all sinners, all of us. Right? Like there's, there's no way out of it. You can't just decide to not be a sinner and then we have a healthy world. What you have to do is live with the sin and the trouble and the failings and the shortcomings, and you got to engineer them away. You've got to accept humans for who they are. And that's what's not happened here. I mean, he thinks everyone could be like him, right? If they just went to Harvard, if they just went to here, if they just, if they just understood and had the relationship that he has with money, we'd all be fine, right? But unfortunately, I don't think he understands that not everyone can just color their money uh, dynamism, Right? It doesn't work. <laughs> like it doesn't work. Look, I uh, I agree in the, in the sense that if I had as much money and access to the printers that Carney does, maybe I would view things differently. But unfortunately, most of the world does not. Um, and quite candidly and frankly, most of the world is not qualified to take a class at Harvard. Sorry, it's true. I'm an asshole for saying it, but it's true. True. Like it's. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you started this segment talking about how much you and your family love life, love everything you have and are grateful for all that you have. And then you also essentially bookend it by reminding people like, look, life can be beautiful if we choose to view it through that lens, but we also have to rec- recognize the inherent flaws in life, in humanity, and in society. You're absolutely right. Trying to act as though, hey, humans aren't inherently greedy. Trying to act as though, oh, humans always act with good intentions like we know history shows us that it's actually patently false and And even worse uh, even worse like you know you'd you'd get a lot of people dunking on him today for being a hypocrite you know oh uh, you know he says he would hunt us down for for doing this stuff with money for the protests but you know he's doing it for other reasons and and for the environment anyway and so be afraid of him well in my mind like you know he, he A lot of people agree with them and no one really cares about hypocrisy. Like I wouldn't have taken this, you know, look at what a hypocrite he is. He's going to turn the power of the state on the people. That's a real fear because of the cognitive bias piece. They might think they're doing it for the betterment of everyone, but that's not the angle that I think is useful to even, you know, deal with these guys. The useful angle is to kind of laugh at them. Like, I mean, it really is in the same way that the makeup was coming off when I w- went for that jog and saw him that day there and said hi and chatted, talked about the office and all that, right? Um, the, 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 the lack of awareness for the world around you and, and the, the crutches being used, you know, not talking about nuclear energy, not talking about cryptocurrency, staying on, on a field where you think you're persuasive if you use words like dynamism and fairness, you know what I mean? And, and that you'll persuade people with those because they sound good is more where I'm saying he's lost, right? Like we don't even have to think about people like that because their chosen avenues of communication are so poor. And, and I mean, could you read a 608 page book today? I can't like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but my attention span has gone right? Like it's nowhere what it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago or anything, right? I think the most pages I ever read in a day were, I think I read the whole, one of the whole Harry Potter books, I think it was number six in a day. That's that's a great 600 page book. That's a great one. Harry Potter. So like one of the easiest books to read ever. And, and we're going to talk about Harry Potter in a few days on the show. I've got a, I've been saving a little Harry Potter story. So, uh, Little Harry Potter. Uh, what was it? Here's the only thing. What was his mate wand made of? Do you remember? Unicorn. And Phoenix, but one more. Oh. All wands are made of one material plus a special material. Oh, uh, is it elm? Holly. Holly. That's what it is. All I'm not, magic clearly wands. Clearly, not as big of a Harry Potter buff as I thought I was. Wow. Think about this. All magic wands are made of Hollywood. <sighs> That was that was a good one. That was it. I literally slapped it. my knee. We're that was a it. knee slapper. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. All right, guys. <laughs> Nolan, thank you so much for joining us, man. Go enjoy Barbados. We will uh, catch you soon. Yeah. Um, all righty, gang. Before we have Dr. Jeff Ross come and join us, I want to touch on a couple of things. 
Uh, I was scrolling through the comments. Yeah, we, we don't get enough comments, so I have time to do that for now. Um, and someone brought up a very valid point about this whole Russia situation going on beyond just you know collecting taxes, trying to gain control, and the game theory of them now being arguably a leader in the Bitcoin space on a global scale. There is this ongoing concern that if they invade the Ukraine, the U.S. is going to slap sanctions all over Russia. Russia, at the same time, has been meeting with China. Russia and China, at the same time, have been meeting with a country that has been under sanctions by the U.S. for almost 50 years now. Uh, My homeland, Iran, the three of them have started to meet and discuss sort of what does life look like outside of U.S. control. This is an assumption, but let's not kid ourselves that that is the conversation being had. Um, And... Iran has been a very vocal and big participant in the Bitcoin network. They've been accepting Bitcoin. They've been dealing with really bad inflation over the last two years. It's been 100% inflation. Um, Putin is, I'm telling you right now, Putin is asking them, how do you handle uh, sanctions? What are the limitations of being under US sanctions? What do we need to plan for in case we are sanctioned? That is a conversation happening. That is scary to think about. Um, but it is something again to be cognizant of and be thinking about because these they are meeting. That is a fact. The US news is not publicizing that because they will never publicize any news regarding Iran unless it de- demonizes them. BBC covers this, global news covers this. Al Jazeera is talking about the meeting between these three countries. Bitcoin is a conversation they're having. And if those three countries are having conversations about Bitcoin, we in America are foolish to not be. But that is my mini final rant for now. In the meantime, if you have not already, use code YTMAG, get 10% off. Come join us down in Miami. Dr. Jeff Ross will be there. Dr. Jeff Ross will be speaking. We're going to cut to a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we'll be chatting with the pleb master himself. <sighs> Welcome back, everyone, and I am joined by Dr. Jeff Ross himself. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, for those of you who are not aware of Dr. Jeff Ross's background, uh, I'm, I'm going to just keep calling you Dr. Ross at this point. Um, <laughs> or just call is, me Jeff if it's easier. <laughs> I'm happy to, but this is a man who is a, a legitimate doctor. Uh, I will let you speak to sort of your background and experience who stumbled and came across Bitcoin. Um, and this is this is a story that we hear so many times, someone working in a sector, someone working in a space, discovering Bitcoin and realizing, hey, this is, this is really something that could help myself, my family, could help potentially my industry. We'll be diving into a lot of that. But uh, Jeff, please share with, with our audience a little bit about sort of how you came to discover Bitcoin while being a doctor at the same time. Sure, sure. Well, it, it, it actually probably came about more not from being a doctor, but because I was also a fund manager. So so I've been a physician since 2009. I actually just retired in at the end of September 2021 uh, from my medical work. So no longer being a uh, doctor anymore. So you don't have to call me doctor. You can call me Jeff if you want. Um, um, uh, it's, it's more of my stage name than anything. Um, so uh, as a fund manager, though, so I founded Bailshire in 2013, and then I've been running a hedge fund since 2014 and uh, registered investment advisory as well since uh, 2014. 
I got attracted to the space initially. Uh, and when I say the space, I mean the crypto space. So I was just one of those guys. I was a degenerate trader back then. Um, I got sucked into crypto because of the risk adjusted returns. They just far surpassed, obviously, what you could get in equities and bonds, commodities, things like that. Um, so I was drawn to it. And uh, 2016 started dabbling in it. 2017, I was really into it. Uh, obviously, it's hard not to be when everything's just going to the moon, right? Had no idea what Bitcoin, I knew what Bitcoin was, but I didn't know why it was special. And um, I was one of those people. So this is before Bitcoin Twitter existed, or at least I knew any type of community like that existed. So um, I was just kind of watching from the outside as the fork wars were going on. I didn't know what that meant, really. I, I thought, well, I don't know, maybe Bitcoin Cash, there's something to it, maybe Litecoin, I don't know. And so I was one of those just, you know, um, goofy people that had kind of a basket of currencies, and I was going to see what uh, what would happen. By the end of 2017, um, and this is a great lesson that, that I learned. So by the end of 2017, I got so sucked into those gains. I had sold all of my Bitcoin and I used to have quite a bit of Bitcoin. Um, class of 2016 was a wealthy doctor. So I was able to buy a lot, had converted all of that into all this other crypto stuff. As we remember in December, 2017, it all peaked. And then you know, early 2018 crash, right? And so what I got left with by about April of 2018 was no Bitcoin a handful of uh, altcoins that had gone down about 90% or so, and a huge tax bill because of my gains from 2017. So I was like, okay, well, that's a really important lesson to learn. This wasn't in my fund, by the way, this is just me personally doing all this stuff. So fast forward to 2019, uh, along speaking of, I was just on that Preston Fish interview, we were talking about that earlier. Preston is the one I used to listen to him a lot because I started my fund as basically a stock picking value investor in kind of the healthcare and technology sectors. Um, and so he went uh, and discovered Bitcoin as well about the same time I did. And then he uh, brought up Safedine's book back in the day, you know, the Bitcoin standard where that came out. And so 2019, early 2019, that's when I read that. And that's when I finally went down the rabbit hole. That's when I finally started to understand, oh, wait, Bitcoin's actually really different. There, there's something special about this. Like it literally is the world's best money. It's decentralized, secure. It has world changing properties. It's going to make the world a better place. I need to spend the time and figure what this thing out. And then as I figured it out, I started teaching my clients about it. Um, so fast forward, we went from no Bitcoin allocation in Veilshire accounts to, you know, 1%. We got off zero to 1%. And then we went to 5%. And then and I could show my clients, like, here's my clients over here on this hand who have no Bitcoin and don't trust it and are scared of it because of all the headlines they see. Here's the clients who have the exact same portfolios, but with Bitcoin in them. And look at the difference over a one year, two year, three year kind of time period, what Bitcoin does. Um, and then, you know, they all kind of fall in line at that place and everybody got kind of excited about it. So number go up technology is very um, enticing to people. It actually works. Um, and um, yeah, I guess the rest is history. So that's kind of my sorted history about how I got into it. So I say I'm the class of 2016, but because I'm stupid, I got held back to 2019. That's that's my, my that's my true class. So, anyways, I, I'm I'm making up for lost time in the meantime. That is that is a hilarious way to put it. <laughs> um, I don't hold it against you for getting held back. I mean, thank you. I'm I'm the guy who heard about it in 2013 uh, to buy to maybe use to do some things that I shouldn't have been doing and like didn't end up buying any. So I knew about it long, long, long time ago. Way before me, yeah. So uh, I'm with you on that notion, but I want to maybe talk a little bit about the psychology of investing because I'm very vocal about, I was pushed into Bitcoin at 2017, like literally on the, I think the day I was convinced was at 16K and I watched oh, wow. it rip to 19. And I'm sitting there like, no, not yet. No, not yet. And I always talk about how if I had bought at that moment, and then literally watched an 80, 90% decline down to about 3000, I would have never looked at it again. Mm -hmm. I would have walked away. So talk, talk a little bit about that mentality of being able to stick it out and learn more. Yeah. Well, I think part of it, um, because I'm sort of a value investor by training, I, um, I'm used to these. Well, first of all, I'm used to the cyclicality of markets. A lot of what I do is I look at the markets from a top down macro view and everything goes in cycles. I really believe that like there's business cycles. There are times where it's uh, GDP is accelerating. There's times where it's decelerating. There's times where inflation is accelerating. There's times where it's decelerating. And it's just this constant flow of things. Stock prices, even if they kind of go up and to the left over, or excuse me, up and to the right, probably looks up, up and to the left on the screen on YouTube. Uh, uh, even though it does that, uh, it's, doing, it's doing it cyclically. So along the way, because of these business cycles. And so um, when I saw what happened in Bitcoin in 20, 
2018, you know, when it declined basically 85% from its peak. Um, it's really, it wasn't that different than other things I had seen, right? Amazon had, uh, I think, a couple 90% drops in its early days. You know, Netflix had huge drops. So equities that are basically um, growth-based, uh, that are based on a growing network, those things, they tend to have almost exponential growth over the long run. But in the short term, again, based on business cycles, they have huge, massive fluctuations. And those huge, like as you mentioned, those huge drops really, I mean, they're soul crushing, right? They, they, you're like, what is this? I did not sign up for this. Yes, I thought I was in it for the long haul, but I didn't plan on watching my balance go from whatever, 10,000 down to $1,500. That's no fun. And so I, realizing that Bitcoin uh, is probably the same sort of thing, like, and I'll backtrack one more thing. I used to be into the stock to flow model and I'm not uh, totally opposed to play. I think that's a great contribution to the space. I think though the, the growth of Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin is more related to network adoption. So as the Bitcoin network grows and more and more people start to you know, own some, use it and go not only get off zero, but go from 1% to 5% to 10 to 20 to 50 to 100%. And, and we probably all know people who are 110% of their net worth is in Bitcoin. I could name a couple right now, but I won't, um, which I think is a little crazy. Anyways, when that we're talking about Metcalf's law at that point, right? So the value of a network is based on the number of users squared. And that's how you kind of figure out what the price is going to do over the long run. So again, what I see with Bitcoin, and this is a fantastic asset that's literally kind of a once in a generation or once in a species type event to have a new form of money that's literally going to transform the world. I think it starts over here at zero and it's going to follow this channel of growth and price appreciation all throughout our lifetimes for sure. Who knows what it's going to do, you know, 100, 200 years from now, but I think it's going to exist then. So it's in this channel. And meanwhile, it's doing this in the channel based on business cycle. So right now we've been on this kind of downswing in the business cycle um, where, and then as of just the last few weeks, we've had, it's been back on an upswing again. And we could talk about why from a macro perspective, I think that's happening. Um, why I got it wrong, got it right, then got it wrong. We can talk about all that kind of stuff. Um, but I just think that's what's going to do. So if you're just a long-term holder and you really believe in the whole Bitcoin story, honestly, the best thing to do is just dollar cost average into it, or just if you want to ape into it today, because today is a great day, why not? Um, then ape into it today and then just hold it. I tell people to have a minimum time horizon of at least 10 years when you hold this thing. So for people today who are just getting into it, it's February, 2022, don't even plan on touching the balance until 2032. And if you can do that, if you can just think of this, like this is sort of like a retirement retirement account or a financial independence account 10 years from today, you, I think it will literally transform your life if you're able to do that. It's, it takes, it's harder, it's harder than it sounds, right? All you got to do is sit and wait. Patience is everything, but very few people have that kind of patience to sit through the volatility. Yeah, I, I would say I, I personally come from like the can slim growth investing sort of strategy. Yep. The sitting on your hands is the hardest thing to do. Yeah, it is sure. so difficult. Um, but why don't we, I, I have a, a few different questions off of what you said. I do want to discuss macro, but in a moment, um, I want to go back a little bit. As you're sort of starting to discuss Bitcoin with your clients who have money with you, what is that conversation like? Like, I'm assuming a lot of them are not necessarily like, oh yeah, let's just dive in on anything. Some of them may just be like, I trust you with my money, go nuts. But what what were some of the pushback conversations like? Sure. Well, that's how, that's how it mostly is. Like I said, so back in 2019, most of my clients trusted me because a lot of them are my friends, you know, so I started as a little friends and family business has grown a lot since then, but it's basically other doctors, nurses that I work with, administrators, uh, things like that. And they're like, you sound almost crazy when you're talking about Bitcoin, um, but I trust you if you really think it's worth it. Please don't put that much in our portfolio was kind of the conversation back then. It's like, so we would put, you know, 1% allocations or even half a percent allocations back then. But then, like I said, so I, on the, on the one hand, I got to do uh, every month, I write a letter to my clients. So every month I would talk a little bit more about Bitcoin, like, hey, you know, here's this property about it. Here's why it's better money. Here's why it's so much better than government fiat, blah, blah, blah. And we'd keep talking about it. And then, oh, by the way, check out the price appreciation, right? I mean, so we started talking about this back when it was well below $10,000 per Bitcoin and putting it into, in, into our accounts. And so um, 
they had they people push back much less when they see their accounts going up, up much more than it would have uh, gone up otherwise it, it's amazing how much that that helps uh win over people right and so and so but then the same kind like right now i i feel terrible for people who have gotten and i actually have some investors who they came in, you know, everybody gets excited. So if you guys remember back last year, about a year ago, February, the price was just ripping, right? It was like sub 10, then it went to sub 20, and then it ripped up and got all the way up to uh, in the 60,000s. And everybody was just freaking out about it. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then kind of the floor dropped out. So I had a bunch of new clients that came in on that earlier peak in the year, and I might be off on my was it 60,000? Let me back up a little bit. Yeah, back then, April. Yeah, so around that range. And then so but the clients who came in then were kind of disenfranchised because they're like, well, I thought this thing only went up and then we crashed. And then we worked our way back in after that painful summer after China banned all the miners and kicked them out of the country. We worked our way back up into the 60,000s again, and then we dumped again. And so for some people, they've had only a bad experience so far. And I really do feel bad for them. I try to encourage them like as a coach, and I'm just like, you are getting stronger. You are learning what it means to be a hodler. You have endured pain. You've already endured at two 50% drops just in the last year. Like that's that's no fun for sure. And so and I just keep telling them like, but think about the long-term picture. Like Bitcoin isn't going anywhere. Look at all of these stories of Bitcoin adoption that are going on all around the world. Think about your friends. Like five years ago, most people hadn't even, either hadn't heard of it or they just thought it was a joke or something that's only used by criminals, right? And then the whole ESG narrative came along and that kind of went again too. And now we're talking about, you know, companies adopting it, countries making it legal tender and using volcanoes to power Bitcoin. I mean, this is just crazy um, how much things have changed. It's like a sci-fi movie in real time watching uh, the network adoption of Bitcoin. So that's how I focus my clients. And we kind of keep that long-term view in my funds. You know, most of my clients are different than how I manage Bitcoin myself. And I'll just take, uh, you know, 30 seconds to do a little tangent. My clients, a lot of them hire me because they don't like volatility and I'm more of a volatility manager than anything. And so that's the only reason why I ever trade Bitcoin. And I, I, I'm going to stop talking about trading Bitcoin on Twitter because I think it throws too many people off. What most people should do and what I personally do is I buy it, I dollar cost average into it, I hold it hopefully for forever. Um, but at least for 10 years. Um, but we'll see what happens in 10 years. Maybe it won't get taxed at that point because government will recognize it as legal tender. Uh, and that'll, that'll be a different story. I want to use it because I think it should be spent and it should be the world's currency. Um, that's that. Over in Valeshire, I manage risk and volatility for people. So that's why I do things like I have stop losses. We, when I think that we're downtrending, I'll sell some, uh, I'll hedge against it in my hedge fund, I'll short um, like crypto exchanges and other things like that to kind of uh, pre, to, um, you know, help dissipate the downside losses. And then we'll get back in again when I think we're back in another uptrend. So sorry, that was very long-winded. Oh, there's a lot to unpack there. And, and if some of these questions I have are a little too sensitive to your work, please just say as much, but sure. I am kind of curious if, if your focus is essentially to, to control volatility, and you've already mentioned like you guys are shorting exchanges and other sort of crypto exposed assets to help balance that. What is sort of the maximum level of exposure you're willing to give a portfolio to Bitcoin then? Totally depends on my macro outlook. So going into the fourth quarter of 2021 in our hedge fund, so that's so, so the hedge fund is the most aggressive thing that I do. And then I have my separately managed account clients. They're aggressive, moderate, and uh, conservative. So very different levels of volatility. Here in my hedge fund, I don't care about volatility. Our goal is to just make uh, generate as much alpha as possible, generate as much profit for my clients as possible, above and beyond what the what a, you know normal 60-40 type investment would do. So in the fourth quarter of uh, 2021, I was fully expecting a parabolic move higher going into Q4 or Q1. Um, and then, uh, as we all know, that didn't happen, right? So what I think happened is that the macro view changed where um, basically in Q4, I believe we peaked from a GDP growth perspective. We stopped accelerating at that point. Um, and then we, we kind of went over the hill and now we're, we're on the downslope of that. We're decelerating from a GDP perspective. I also assumed we were peaking in inflation in December as well. I will say that that literally has just changed in this past week. And I think that's why we're seeing the changing market dynamics that we are. So, um, and I wanna answer your question. When I'm very bullish, 
I'll go very bullish in the hedge fund. I was about 70% long and I had call options, Bitcoin. I was, I was long Bitcoin miners, things like that. We were going to shoot the lights out if Bitcoin continued to go parabolic. It didn't. So I actually ended up having a tough December. I didn't turn, I turned, went from bullish to neutral, like the final week of December. And then I actually flipped bearish the first week of January when the price of Bitcoin was something like 46K or something. I heard Jerome Powell speak and I said, wow, he's actually serious about um, raising rates. He's, he's talking about being hawkish, I think at the wrong time, uh, because I think market fundamentals, the, the underlying macro stuff that I look at, like I said, I think they've peaked and they're going to decelerate from here. That's the wrong time for the Fed to be putting on the brakes. Uh, I was right throughout January until the very kind of end of January. And then we had an abrupt bottoming, both in Bitcoin and then a little bit later, the other risk on assets. They since have, have taken off again. Why did that happen? So, and if that's okay, I'll, I'll slightly dip into the macro just because uh, that's what... Um, yeah, that's what I think about a lot. So what I think happened is I do think we did peak uh, in the fourth quarter for GDP growth and we're decelerating, but I think that inflation is actually going to come in hotter than expected. So I don't know that we're out of the woods yet for this super, super high, really unfortunate inflation, right? It, it just ruins quality of life for everybody. That's what I hate about government fiat. One of the things I hate about government fiat. Um, it's making life miserable for people. And I think it's gonna come in high. And I think the market has sniffed that out. So because of that, when that happens, when inflation stays high, even with decelerating uh, economic growth, risk on assets still can do pretty well actually, which is kind of ironic. Most people um, associate that with a bad environment for risk on assets, but what does that mean? So interest rates on the long end of the US treasury curve are staying high um, uh, because it, it kind of coincides with what inflation is doing. Um, things that are associated with that, like financials, financial equities, they tend to do well when rates are rising. So financial stocks, what I thought they were going to be coming down, they've actually bucked the trend and they're going up. Energy has been holding on strong. And that's actually part of what's driving these high inflation numbers is that oil itself uh, has been at very high levels. Uh, and then other just like tech stocks, Bitcoin and related assets, they all tend to do well in that environment. Um, so that's why I think we have that abrupt change. Um, for the next several weeks, um, but things can change again, and and we can talk about that too if we want. But I'll, I'll stop there. I, I uh, I'm down to. I do want to. We will dive heavy into this literally after this one question. Um, but I do kind of want to ask on the conservative side of the fund: Are you more focused on the, like populating that with bonds potentially, or are there sort of REITs or other value, maybe commodity stocks? Can you just talk to us a little bit about what a conservative Bitcoin exposed portfolio maybe looks like? Sure. So I think, first of all, I think bonds are an absolutely terrible long-term investment. So I'm, I'm with Greg Foss on that, right? I'm one of the Oss brothers, Foss, Moss, and Ross. Um, I, I, uh, I, I hate them as much as he does for the long run. They're literally uh, return-free risk. You're just basically saying, I'm going to lock in money and I'm going to lose it over the long run. And, and you know, you'll pay me 1%. And in the meantime, it'll depreciate like 7% or more per year. And won't that be great? So there's basically no reason to hold bonds over the long run. I very much believe that. That said, when you go into a risk off environment, when people are scared, some things happen predictably. One is that everybody sells their equities for the most part. And they so when they sell that, that means they're hoarding cash. They're buying the US dollar. So that's why the dollar is known as kind of the, um, the ultimate risk off asset. Just under the dollar is US treasuries, long dated US treasuries for the most part, people tend to buy those. And so when you buy a bond, the price goes up and the yield goes down. They're like a teeter totter uh, inverse of each other. And so that's usually what happens. And that's what's interesting is we're not seeing that now. Yields are still rising, bond prices are going down. That suggests we're not in a risk off environment. The bond market is usually pretty smart and in tune with that kind of thing. Um, so if we are in a risk off environment, and I'll skip ahead a little bit, I think we're getting into one in Q2. Um, Q1 is kind of surprising that it it's, might not be one right now. And that's why I think we're having this little liftoff. I think we're going to dump again, personally. So I think we're going to get back to a risk off environment, and it's going to be kind of ugly. If that were the case, one thing to look for is you you should see the US dollar spiking in value, and you should see long dated US treasuries also going up in value and yields falling. Uh, concurrently with that. Um, so that's the only time I hold bonds in our um, portfolios. 
it's when I think we're going into a serious risk off environment. And it's usually only for like a couple of months uh, at the most at a time. And then for the rest of the, you know, the quarters and years, I don't hold any bonds. This may be difficult because I think we're on the same page. <laughs> um, I personally don't buy into this note. I think this is a pump fake. Um, there is volume coming in, but we're still below on major indexes below their 50 day moving averages. There's nothing that the Fed has done or said that's made me change my mind. Oh, they're, they're going to repump the market. Um, this was in, in all fairness, like this was an artificial market we've seen for about the last 22 months, 20, 23 months. Um, and it'll be interesting. I, I am kind of curious though. So you said that your stance on inflation has shifted. Um, what were the components or what were the factors that helped you sort of change your mind about that? Basically what I was talking about with what um, risk on assets are doing, how there was basically a, a phase transition that you probably noticed at the end of January. That's when Bitcoin bottomed and went back up. And I didn't believe it. And I was very public about that. I don't believe this. I was still shorting it at the time, not shorting Bitcoin. I don't short Bitcoin, just so everybody knows. I was shorting uh, crypto exchanges uh, and miners. Uh, that's what I do kind of as proxies. Um, that changed and uh, treasury yields, long-term yields kept rising. And so prices kept falling. That suggests that they don't believe um, that we're going into this sort of risk off, uh, risk off environment. So something changed and I agree with you that I think this is a pump fake. I think that what it's gonna do is bring in tons of new bullish people, tons of money who are gonna believe it. And then it's really gonna wreck a lot of people. And I hate to say stuff like that, but that's kind of my view too. So I don't know how long this lasts. That's why I'm using sort of tight trailing stops on a lot of things I do right now. I think we go up for maybe weeks. And then as we get closer to the second quarter and more data starts coming in, and if we do see a deceleration in inflation and a continued deceleration in economic indicators, then we're going to revert, I think, back to a risk-off environment. And, um, and it could get ugly. And I, this is the, the thing I keep talking about, and I hate talking about trading Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is so perceptive because it's the world's only true free market. It, it figured this out in uh, March of 2020 when we had a similar environment. And then the other similar environment was the fourth quarter of 2018. And Bitcoin, if you remember, if we, you know, you guys have been in it long enough. So 2018 from January to November, Bitcoin dropped from about 20,000, just under 20,000 to like 6,500. So that was a huge drop, something like a 60 some percent drop already. And then it went totally like flatline sideways. And then it dumped 50% on top of that. Um, in about November to into December of 2018. Really painful, super awful. And we have the exact same type macro setup as we did back then. That's why I think it's possible that we do that again. It depends what we do in the meantime. We may prop up back to like maybe 50,000 or you know hover around this kind of 40 to 50 range for a little while. I wouldn't surprise me to see another 50% dump. That, by the way, would shouldn't um, offend people or scare people. That would be a fantastic buying opportunity. And that's what I kind of hope happens because if you can anticipate it and raise cash for it, then you can like back up the truck and, and just load up on Bitcoin at that point uh, for the long run, you know, sell a kidney, sell an eyeball, you know, whatever, you, you know, it's lamps, chairs. I got a lamp back there. I could sell a lava lamp right there. I could sell. Um, so things like that. I'm kidding, by the way, this is not an individual investment advice, but but it's possible that this could happen because this scenario has played out before. And I think we're setting up for a similar scenario, just like March 2020, just like fourth quarter 2018. Um, I love it. I mean, I'm all for it. Let me stack stats at a cheaper rate. Right. Yep. It's a, it's a, I mean, I stack every day regardless, but uh, Pop, Papa can use a whole coin here or there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, talk to us a little bit though about... So I personally am in a different school of thought right now where I think this four-year cycle has been broken. I think we anticipated a happening increase, a, a shoot up in the price, which we have seen every four years. And it did, it took about seven months for the price to really start to rip post happening in 2020. But we haven't really seen that crash that typically followed these parabolic rises on each four-year cycle. So where or what factors are you paying attention to to trigger that? 
Yeah, so first first point is I don't think the four year cycles uh, are going to exist anymore. I think they were they were a past thing. They were very obvious in retrospect that they were going on. They were primarily driven by the miners and by the four year happening cycle. I just think it's very different now. So I think, you know, most of the Bitcoin that's ever going to be created has been created to this point. I think we're up to around 19 million or so. So 2 million left over the next, you know, 119 years. Um, and we'll see most of that, obviously, within the next like 20 years. Um, those same uh, mechanics that that drove that four year cyclical price, I don't think exist anymore. Miners now don't have to sell Bitcoin at nearly as much as they used to for capital expenditures. Um, they have access to the public markets. They have access. They can borrow money. They can, you know, sell equity. They can do lots of things to in order to just uh, uh, produce and then hold Bitcoin on their balance sheets. They can even borrow money from like the equity markets or from, you know, borrow money and use that to buy Bitcoin on top of the the mining that they're doing. So I just don't think miners drive the price of Bitcoin so much anymore. And I think Bitcoin now officially just trades as an accepted macro asset. And in that, in that scenario, that means it's, it's, uh, it's gonna rise and fall based on business cycles and other macroeconomic indicators like every other asset does, like stocks do, bonds do, commodities do, blah, blah, blah. So that's what I'm expecting going forward. The only one major thing about Bitcoin that's different and that most Bitcoiners understand and the world still does not understand is that not only is Bitcoin the best risk on asset that the world has ever seen, it's also the best risk off asset the world has ever seen. So the, the role that the US dollar plays right now is as the world's reserve currency and as the premier risk off asset, meaning that when everyone is scared and they wanna take risk off the table, they do that by selling everything else and holding US dollars. At some point, there's gonna be enough people like all of us here that think, well, Bitcoin is so much better than the US dollar. Why would I ever sell everything and go into the dollar, I should be selling everything going into Bitcoin. That we're still the very, very small minority of people who understand that and understand it's the world's risk off asset. We need to have, you know, the majority or close to the majority of market participants believing that as well. And once they do, then Bitcoin becomes, which is amazing, and that has never happened, I believe, simultaneously the best risk off and risk on asset at the same time. And that that's just to say it's the greatest asset that has ever existed. At some point, the market cap will get so big in, in Bitcoin when it does that. And I don't know, I, I think that that happens somewhere between 20 trillion and $100 trillion market cap for Bitcoin. I think it's basically when it has absorbed most of the value of the world's fiat currencies and starts to um, absorb most of the world's store of value properties, you know, gold, real estate, stocks, bonds, they all have store of value, a store of value component to them. Bitcoin, I believe, will just over time eat up that stuff. It's, you know, it's the super massive black hole that's sucking in all that value. Um, it's inevitable to me, but how fast that happens, I don't know. It could be years. It could be decades. I'm not sure. Yeah, if, if any of us had that magic ball, uh, let me know. I'll right. pay for your flight to Vegas, and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get a lot of sats after that trip. Exactly. Um, you bring up a, a valid point, and this is a question that I also know you don't have the magic ball to, but there is there is this coupling of the equities market and Bitcoin. The price is rising and falling as such. Uh, the question is two parts. Firstly, what do you think has really instigated this? Has it been the increased offering of Bitcoin equities in the public markets? And secondly, how do we decouple because this was supposed to be a hedge against the US economy, essentially? This is kind of a loaded question and it really depends on the time frame you're looking at. So a so couple things, short term time frames, if everybody is in a risk off, scared panic mode, the correlation of all assets basically goes to one. Or, or, and not all assets. So it could go to negative one relative to the U.S. dollar, meaning that you know people sell everything and buy the dollar. Um, or, and by selling everything, that means selling Bitcoin, selling altcoins, selling equities, selling real estate, selling whatever. That's what we say when they're when the correlation approaches one. That's what people do when they're panicked. When people are less panicked, we see that correlation number drop. It gets lower. So it's not perfectly correlated, and it's only it only approaches one during those kind of scary risk off time is the most recent example was March of 2020. The other thing is over the long run is it's it's been similar to US equities on a long term perspective because Bitcoin and equities are taking on the function of a store of value. So 
the U.S. dollar is a horrible store of value, right? It depreciates. You can you can count on it depreciating over time and being a terrible store of value. Because of that, people are desperate to find stores of values and other things. That's why everybody is, you know, in stock in the stock market. Even though even if they're not comfortable with stocks and have no idea what they're doing, they still own stocks if they're if they can if they can afford them. Um, that's not even to mention the poor people that literally don't have any assets and all life is just horrible for them because it's getting more and more expensive year after year because the cost of living is, is going up year after year. So because they all have this sort of store of value function, real estate is included as well, their correlation tends to be kind of very similar over the long run, you know, not, not one, but, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 in that, in that range. Interestingly, though, in kind of like a, if you're talking like kind of quarters to, to years, Bitcoin is is traditionally kind of uncorrelated with almost any other asset. And I think that's because people are just sort of trying to figure out what kind of asset it really is. Um, I expect it to get less correlated with risk on assets, especially as more and more people own it. And like I talked about earlier, once it transitions in everyone's mind that, hey, this actually is the best risk off asset that's where it will decouple itself from uh, like stocks, small cap stocks, tech stocks, all that kind of stuff that's correlated to now. It will decouple from that. And, um, and, and then that correlation, I think will go back more to like zero. And, and if anything, Bitcoin will become more correlated with simply with the US dollar until it kind of, it'll jostle with it uh, to be the world's sort of safe haven asset and it'll eventually win and surpass it. And then everything else might be I don't know what's going to happen at that point. That's a little too hard to tell, but um, it, it may become just simply the world's greatest risk off asset at that point. Um, we'll see. Hard to say. We're, we're, we're still years away from that, I think. Um, I, I love that you are able to sort of explain this in terms that are not only for someone like me, very finance oriented, but digestible for everyone else. Um, those of you watching, you better be taking notes. This is, this is gold right here. Um, I want to it's talk better than gold. It's Bitcoin. <laughs> gold, gold is old, man. Just kidding. Sorry. Uh, Alex ahead. McShane, that's the quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I want to now talk a little bit broader on a global scale, first focusing on just Bitcoin. Um, what effect, do, like we saw, for example, China banning mining, boom, hash rate crashes, Bitcoin price ha crashes. What are other political effects on a global scale that you're keeping an eye on Russia announcement earlier today, India announcement last week, us, whatever they decide to do. Uh, what is it that you're keeping an eye on? So this is pretty unpopular with people, but I am, um, I'm similar to Warren Buffett in the, in the matter of, I don't really care about the news and I don't really think it affects Bitcoin much. And, and with the caveat that only when it's real significant news to the Bitcoin network, that's like very tangible. And for example, when China banned miners and made it illegal for them to operate and they said, you have to get out and you have like a month to do it, that was a hugely powerful, tangible effect to the Bitcoin network, right? Literally, we watched the hash rate dump over 50% in a month. That was crazy. That was unprecedented. We, the price followed it. It also went down uh, over 50% when that happened. That's the kind of news, the only kind of news that I'm really interested in as far as do I make an investment decision based on something like that? Yes, I would. Is it good news that Russia is talking about, you know, adopting it and regulating uh, Bitcoin? Uh, yes. Is it is it cool that they're probably going to start, hopefully start mining it and we're starting the whole game theory of the nation states going on with the major, major players? Yes, that would be great. Do I think that has a significant effect, though, on the short term price? I actually don't. I know that some people may read that and be like, oh, I'm going to buy Bitcoin because, you know, maybe Russia is going to start buying it as a reserve asset or something like that. But I don't really believe that moves price the way that macro conditions move price. So I'm not a great source to talk about when it comes to geopolitical kind of issues, because I honestly don't really care. Um, it doesn't affect, I don't base any trading or investment decisions based on things like that. And if it does have an effect, it's kind of like when um, companies report earnings and you'll see a pop in the price because it did something, but then it usually settles back down and kind of goes to about where it was. That's what I, that's how I view news events. Do they cause really short-term traders and algorithmic traders to make moves? Um, and, but for the most part, it doesn't change any kind of longer term perspective that I have. All that does say, I'll say one final thing and then stop. Uh, the only thing it really does is it just continues to show that network adoption, adoption of Bitcoin across the world, whether you're a person or a company uh, or a nation state, 
it's inevitable. It's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. El Salvador happened about five years earlier than I thought it would uh, with a nation state adopting it and considering it legal tender. But since it did that, it just opened the floodgates for anything is possible, really. And so um, I don't know how fast adoption occurs, but I do know that it, it, it is inevitable. You're not wrong. I, I'd say the perfect example of this is you, if you look at when the news came out about El Salvador, everyone and their mother thought this is gonna, this is the hundred K news and the price literally went down. Right. Yeah. It's literally actually, the, yeah. It's still way down from when they first announced that. So, or no, it's not now it's up a little bit, but it was this in totally. the meantime. So yeah. So it doesn't, it, it seems like it should have more of an effect and all that does is strengthen the long-term picture of it and it should give people lots of confidence that look this isn't going anywhere right you can't stop bitcoin stopping bitcoin is as easy as stopping the internet which is to say you can't it's just ubiquitous it's everywhere you can make it difficult if you're a government like china you can make it very difficult for your citizens to own it and to mine it and to do things like that but you can't stop it and as long as there are any countries in the world that are amenable to bitcoin and there are tons right and tons of u.s states who are amenable to it as well um it, it, there's just there's nothing you can do about it. So it's definitely inevitable, not necessarily imminent, these price increases, but definitely inevitable over the long run. I think it also just makes sense your your outlook on this because your time horizon is so long, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, that it's like the little news cycle here, it doesn't impact your long-term investment decisions right. or outlooks. Um, so I won't bore you with any more questions in that vein. Um, and and we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more about these equity markets. Um, before we do that, I want to shout out Rasta. I love the name. Thank you for liking and subscribing. If you are watching and you're not subscribed, please make sure you do. Uh, additionally, if you have not already, make sure you go buy your tickets to Bitcoin 22. Use code YT mag. Dr. Jeff Ross himself will be in attendance. He's going to be speaking there. I myself will be there. My co-host Alex McShane, Chris, our producer, we're all going to be down there. Use code YT Mag. Um, we'll throw some more carrot codes into these chats as well. Um, but diving back into a couple of things with you, uh, Jeff, I want to get a sense of what you're paying attention to with uh, crypto equities. Uh, I will say the bad word. Uh, I'm. I like to say I'm the equities guy here. Uh, what are some crypto exposed equities that you like, and some that you're just like, no, actually I don't. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm. Um... You know, I come from the equities world, so that's sort of my my playground. And in fact, what I do for in within my hedge fund and uh, my Veilshare accounts, I don't own spot Bitcoin. There's a way that I can do it, um, but it's it's a it's a clunky way to do it, and I like to be able to trade it if I need to. So, I like to uh, buy and hold and sometimes sell equities that are related to Bitcoin um, and the whole crypto space. Um, because it's just so much simpler to do. And what I like about equities, and, and I'll give a quick overview first, what I love about Bitcoin related equities is most of them are basically leveraged ways to play the price movement of Bitcoin. So if we're in a Bitcoin bull market, the, the leveraged equities tend to go up even more in value than Bitcoin itself does, than the underlying asset does. And in a bear market, they tend to decrease in value uh, more quickly than Bitcoin itself does. Case in point, so just from November through the end of January, like third week of January, um, we had this big plunge in the price of Bitcoin. It dropped about 50%. What did worse? Uh, Bitcoin miners did much worse. Crypto exchanges, Coinbase. I love shorting Coinbase. No offense if you're a Coinbase fan. Love shorting Coinbase. Uh, that that did worse. So my hedge fund actually did better because I was short a lot of those things. Um, and I, and I actually really love miners, by the way, and I, I'm a big fan of them, so I don't mean anything. A lot of people get really upset when I say that I short Bitcoin miners, but uh, it's just it's always just a short term thing as a hedge. And then when I flip around, so when we flip bullish again and I feel like we've bottomed, those very same things tend to do better. Like I said, they'll outperform the, the spot price of Bitcoin. So. Bitcoin miners, I think when we're in a bull market are fantastic things to own. You know, I like Hut8, I like Marathon, I, you know, all the uh, bit farms. Um, I think they're all great ones. There's, there's many more Riot. Um, if you want kind of an ETF exposure to miners and crypto exchanges, which I think is a pretty solid play, especially over the long run, there's an ETF called Block, B-L-O-K, um, that has uh, miners in it and it has exchanges like, so like Galaxy Digital, Mike Novogratz's company. That company, by the way, has been my best performer ever. It just shot the lights out in my hedge fund. I actually sold it um, 
uh, late December, early January, I think for the, you know, uh, and took, took profits on it, but it, it, it's just a, a killer company. If you want, if you're trying to, you know, generate alpha and make games, um, I don't love it that it's, you know, an, an, uh, an altcoin casino. That's not, that's not my favorite part about it, but there, you know, all these businesses I think are basically riding the coattails of Bitcoin. Some do it, um, for fantastic purposes. Some do it for more disingenuous purposes, just simply to profit. So I'm not as crazy about those. The companies that I love are like the, um, strike Jack Mahler's company, love strike Swan. I know the guys at Swan love Swan. Um, I want both of those companies to go public so I can invest in my hedge fund and just, you know, hold them for forever. Um, love supporting companies like that. And that's why I like uh, owning miners as well. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. Um, I like to use those. They're easy to buy and sell within my fund. And like I said, you can kind of accentuate your gains in either direction, uh, whether you're using them as a hedge on the short side or um, to bolster on the long side. Oh, and I didn't mention MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy obviously is kind of a, it's basically an ETF, you know, that we still don't have a spot ETF by MicroStrategy, right? I mean, that's, they just have tons and tons of Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, it's kind of a leveraged way to play Bitcoin. Um, so if you want to hold it. And then, you know, I still like Grayscale. I tweeted a little bit earlier in the last year, the spot price of Bitcoin is down, I think 5%. I don't have it in front of me, but down 5% from one year ago, which is unfortunate. Um, but GBTC is down about 35%. Why? Because it was trading at a premium back in last February. And since then, that premium has not only gone away to zero, it's gone well below zero. So now it's trading at like a 23% discount to, the, to its net asset value to the NAV. That's unfortunate because that was one of my larger holdings in, in my Veilshire accounts. I do think though, and it's what I talked about, at some point that discount to NAV will go away. And when it and, and it, why will it go away? Because at some point the, the SEC will approve a Bitcoin spot ETF. I think almost to the day that that happens, the discount to NAV disappears and goes to zero. That means you'll get the price appreciation of underlying spot uh, Bitcoin. And as that discount to NAV goes back to zero, you get that as sort of an added bonus on top of it. So while that's been a terrible investment for the past year, I think at some point in the next year or two, it'll actually outpace uh, the price of Bitcoin itself. Does the creation of a spot ETF happen before or after the U.S. government views Bitcoin as a commodity in your mind? I think it happens before that. And I don't know, I don't know the timing of either of those things. I do think that there's a good likelihood that it happens, that we get a spot Bitcoin ETF approved this year. I think probably the second half of 2022. If I had to guess, that's what I would say. Um, it could be 2023, but um, I have no insight in that. I know that Gary Gensler likes it. And as I talked about on Press and Pish's show, I think that Gensler is holding the spot Bitcoin ETF hostage in order to get his other demands met that he wants to clean up crypto exchanges. He, he considers all altcoin, we're digressing here, sorry, but he considers basically all altcoins to be unregistered securities and that chaps his hide, he doesn't like that. He's very clear about that, that they're coming after you unless you come to us first kind of mentality. The best way to get at all of those unregistered securities called altcoins is by going after the crypto exchanges that house them. So that's the easiest point of attack because they're centralized. So I think that's what they're going to do. I think once that stuff gets cleaned up, and I don't know how they clean it up, I don't know what that means for altcoins. Do they get a slap in the wrist? Do they get fined some random amount of money? Do they try to completely shut them down? I don't see how that's possible, but um, it's possible. Um, I know, I know people say you go, you know, you unplug the AWS servers and then they're out. Um, but I, th I think it's more complicated than that personally. So whatever that, whatever happens, he's holding that hostage until these demands are met. Once they're met, then I think he approves the spot Bitcoin ETF. And hopefully that happens in the second half of this year. How much Bitcoin do you think Gensler has? Because I'm convinced a lot of these guys hold things up because they're still trying to accumulate. Yeah. Um, I have no idea. I think he owns it for sure. Um, how much? Probably quite a bit. I mean, he's been, he's known about it for, uh, he taught the course, right, at MIT. So he knows about Bitcoin and um, he knew about it from, for, he's known about it for several years. I don't know how much, but I do think he owns some for sure. And I do think he favors Bitcoin. I think he's made that extremely clear in his comments. Um, I do want to present one question, if I can find it, that, uh, one of our audience our viewers sent us via Twitter really quickly before I forget to ask you it. Um, 
obviously coming from the healthcare space, if you are interested in healthcare investing, you did, everyone should check out uh, Jeff's interview with Preston. They talked a lot about different healthcare stocks and the future that you see in that industry validated me because I was heavily invested in genetic type stocks as well as tele- telecommunication stocks. So that was awesome. Um, but what, if at all possible, can Bitcoin fix in the healthcare industry in your eyes, in your mind? It's a good question. And most people don't get this because they're, they don't seem to be related. But what I tell people uh, regularly is that, you know, what Bitcoin offers is a truly free market. And the healthcare, traditional healthcare, needs nothing more than to be free and open instead of being opaque and stodgy. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's so inefficient. It, it makes you want to just pull your hair out. That's why I don't have any hair anymore is because of working in healthcare. You know, I, and I, nothing against, like, I love my physician friends. I, I love being a doctor, all that kind of stuff. I'm not hacking on the healthcare um, field in general, but most people who work in healthcare, especially who have been in there, you know, 10 years or more, they all kind of have that same sort of uh, feeling towards it, kind of resentment, kind of like I'm in this system that's way bigger than me and I'm just a cog in the system and um, I kind of hate it because I have to play by their rules or I'm out. And that's just how the system has become. So it's, it's so much, it has removed itself so far away from the old historical physician patient relationship that I think it's tragic and super sad. There's all of these people in the middle of that relationship who are, you know, taking fees and telling you what to do. And, and you have all these legal issues and, and you're constantly under threat of being sued, all these kind of things like that. What Bitcoin could offer is simply free market uh, transparency to healthcare. So if you were, so say I were still being a doctor, say I was starting a practice today, I was a radiologist and, and something called an interventional radiologist, which means I did little surgeries, image guided surgeries. I could have, I could open a practice today and just be like, you know what, we accept Bitcoin. I'm going to put Bitcoin on my balance sheet. If I were counseling anybody as your consultant to any physicians out there, I would strongly recommend doing that. And I'm not kidding. Like take your balance sheet. Every, every group has a balance sheet of whatever, you know, millions of dollars. 10%, 10%, take 10% and put that into Bitcoin. Yes, it's volatile, but it's volatile more to the upside. So over the long run, um, that will actually, be, like, like Michael Saylor is doing with MicroStrategy, that will probably be your biggest part of your business. It will actually actually generate the most profits is the Bitcoin you hold as a reserve asset. Um, and if you allow patients and you create this sort of Bitcoin ecosystem and just kind of ignore the middle players in between, like that's something, you know, Doctors, I said this on Preston's show too, doctors love to hate insurance companies like because they just literally, and I, I'm really sorry if there's any insurance people listening, but they make your lives miserable. They, they, a doctor says, I think we should do this for this patient. And the insurance company says, no. And you're like, what do you mean? No. And then you're fighting with the insurance company and the, the patients are crying and we're mad and all this kind of stuff. And then they only reimburse part of it or something like that. If you could get rid of all of that and just be like, look, the best doctors, everybody knows who they are because the current system we have with tech and social media, right? You can say, here's a good doctor. I recommend him for this surgery. Um, and, and, and then I can be like, hey, you know what? I'll do this surgery and, I, and it's a free market because we actually, you know, right now, if you want to go get an MRI or you want to go get uh, your appendix removed or we'll pick, pick a procedure, you have no idea what it's going to cost. And that's because it's all opaque. You don't know from hospital to hospital what's more expensive. You don't know what insurance companies are going to pay for or, you know, provide. Imagine if you could go and just see like, hey, Dr. X uh, has a 10 out of 10 rating for uh, doing appendectomies for removing your appendix. Um, and he charges uh, like in the mid range for the price. You would go with that guy 10 out of 10 times if you knew that if you had that transparency in the system. But right now you're sort of left in the dark with all that. So I'm really getting esoteric here. But basically what it does is that that free market application is absolutely what healthcare needs. It's literally the only thing that can fix the massive runaway costs of healthcare, especially in the U.S. It would make it so much better. It would improve patient physician relationships. The solution, you know, I'm 47. I've been watching the healthcare debacle from a political perspective since the 80s. Even when I was a kid, I remember people talking about this. It will never, ever, ever be solved politically. It just will not. And so Bitcoin does this end around, kind of like how they do an end around the financial system. They need to do an end around on the te- on the uh, healthcare system as well and completely transform it from this whole like parallel financial system. And I believe that will happen. That's also inevitable. Um, but 
healthcare will be one of the last dominoes to fall because it's so huge and stodgy. I, I'm joking saying this, but you're really telling me that a bunch of lawyers in DC can't figure out what's best as far as healthcare goes. <laughs> Can you believe it? Uh, who would have thought? <laughs> um, I, I'm kind of curious because honestly, as you're talking, my, my head is racing because it's like we're almost at this perfect time where you have the soundest money being accessible to citizens. You have technology starting to get implemented in the healthcare industry where you have ideas for longevity, you have ideas for gene editing, you have potential cures for diseases that we've never even thought we could. And the access to these doctors, you can be somewhere so long as you have internet access, hopefully we can democratize it in a way where the best doctor for what I need is located in London. I'm in LA. Well, you know what? Thank God I got an iPhone or thank God I have a, a mm -hmm. video uh, conferencing capability. It almost seems like the merging of all the three of these things can really help break this industry. Yeah, totally. I think we're clearly at that point right now. So we finally have all of the pieces in place to transform it. And again, it's going to be outside of what the politicians are saying, the attorneys are saying, outside of uh, what the insurers are. So all these people who have like long time historical vested interest in the current traditional healthcare system, we need to just bypass all of them. And that's what technology does. That's what decentralization does, the internet does. And you're right, all the pieces are in place. That's why I'm just so excited about what the future is going to bring. And especially for me, you know, I come from radiology. So that's just all digital images. So I was the guy, if you go get an MRI or a CAT scan or something, I'm the doctor who would look at the images and then dictate a report. And that's the report you see in your medical records. Mm -hmm. There's no reason that that can't be done by anybody. Like for instance, I, I'm in Colorado. My last two years, I worked for a group out in New York. I, you know, I, had, I was reading their patient list, even though I'm 2000 miles away sitting in Colorado. There's no reason I couldn't do that for any country anywhere in the world. Um, and then on top of that, to, to even further to your point, because of technology, AI, artificial intelligence is, is able. So the, uh, all I'm looking for as a radiologist is patterns on the screen. And so I look at a thing and I, I look at a CT and I said, well, you know, normally the small bowel looks like this. Normally the liver looks like this. This doesn't look the same. Something's wrong. And, and it's pattern recognition. And so you can teach computers to do that same thing. And someday I believe this AI will put all people, all radiologists out of a job um, because it's just, it's just basically solving puzzles and pattern recognition and they'll be able to do it, you know, a hundred times faster. And, you know, at one, one hundredth of the cost of hiring a whole team of radiologists to do it. And so that's going to help drive down healthcare costs. So yes, I'm very excited about the future. We're not there yet, but I think we're sort of in the ugly transition phase right now. And it's going to be uh, much better 10, 20 years from now. You, you almost, uh, you almost fully answered my next question, which is in, in fact, AI entering the healthcare space. Like I'm a, I'm a data nerd myself, uh, like image recognition and those type of stuff is already in effect. I have, I was having this conversation last night with my dad about, honestly, I view automation entering the healthcare industry as going to, as the most disruptive, uh, transition of work where you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that many doctors have been collecting. They are going to, I, I personally think it's more than just radiology. Are there certain healthcare jobs where you're like the human touch is required here? Yes. Yes. And no, I think, I think from being a radio, well, first of all, let me, let me backtrack patients. Most patients still kind of want that patient physician relationship, especially older patients. They kind of want like somebody to actually lay eyes on you. And actually you want to show that. I mean, it's cool. You can show stuff on a screen and be like, check out this rash. What do you think it is? But some things just require human touch to figure that out. And so that part will really never go away. There'll be some little aspect of that, but that's a small part of healthcare. I think especially being a radiologist, and I'm obviously biased, but the physical examination side of medicine has the importance of that has greatly been reduced over the last several decades because of the rise of imaging studies. So the fact that we can do an MRI or CT or ultrasound or x-ray and actually look inside of the person's body, you know, a, a, a clinician can, can do an exam and they can push on your belly and stuff and they can say, well, I think you might have appendicitis, but I'm not sure. You actually know the answer if you get a CT scan and look and like, I can actually say, yes, you have appendicitis. Yes, it's ruptured. Yes, you need surgery right now. So imaging has changed that. That's the advancements of technology. You know, I can look in your head and say, you know, the reason you're having headache, unfortunately, is you actually have a tumor in there. And, you know, you couldn't tell that from a physical, I can't push around and say, I have a tumor. You have to look inside. So, so technology has drastically improved medicine and clinical acumen. 
And so to your point, I think there are many things that will be replaced by technology. And as that stuff just gets better and better and better, you really don't need that human touch, except only for a small minority of cases. So yeah, that's, that's great. And I mean, if, even if it doesn't, that's it. So people will argue like, oh, you still need human touch. You still need, yes, but that's a very small minority. If you can transform the other 90% of kind of healthcare and medicine and make it more efficient and way better and, you know, cheaper, um, then f why wouldn't you do that? And I think that's inevitable as well. Yeah. I feel like, uh, the lobbyists in DC will have some some of their own made up reasons as to why we shouldn't do that. But oh, sure. I, I'm with you. I, I personally, I hate the healthcare system in this country, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't try to act like I know the solution. I hope technology continues to push healthcare forward. I mean, look, what, 500, 600 years ago, human life ended by 40, 50 years old right. at, at the high end of things. Um, and here we are, average lifespan in America is over 70. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with or caught some of our conversation with Peter Diamandis last week where we were talking longevity and sort of this idea that mm -hmm. as healthcare technology continues to, to move forward, there's the potential that we are going to move the goalpost forward as well as far as how long we live. Um, just from a, a, someone with your sort of worldview as a, someone who understands the financial markets, someone who really understands healthcare and, and the effects of that, what what worries you about a world where human life almost can exist for a hundred plus years? Is there concerns with that in your mind, as far as the economy goes, as far as healthcare capabilities go? Um, or are you sort of, no, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, I'm all about longevity. I would say that, you know, humans, um, they have a way of making the world better and also screwing everything up at the same time too. So what happens if suddenly people are just living much longer? Um, I mean, then you, then you got to talk about things like, well, what about wars? What about overpopulation? Blah, blah, blah. I think human ingenuity always comes through in surprising ways and people learn how to live. You know, I think, you know, if you would have said 50 years ago that we, that the population would have exploded and longevity would have increased so much we wouldn't have even believed it, you know, and that's, but that's just kind of how we are and we adapt and, and we improve. And, and so generally, I think that's a very good thing. Um, I don't think it's just healthcare in and of itself that actually, um, and that's, a, I think a common misconception is that longevity is related to the quality of healthcare. I don't think that's true. I think as far as populations go, longevity is based more on individual lifestyle choices. So as a population, are you sedentary or not? Do you actually have a good diet or not? And I would say that this whole fiat diet mentality that Americans have been on since like the 1950s, and it's just gotten worse and worse and worse every decade. That's why we have tons of issues that we have. And if we could solve that and get people eating like way healthier, like way better nutrition, quit eating the process. And I don't want to go down this tangent right now, but if, if uh, what I think is better nutrition, basically, um, if, if, if all Americans started doing that, obesity rates would massively decline, uh, you know, high blood pressure issues, cancer, tons of things that people are dying from, heart attacks right now, strokes, all of that stuff would drastically come down and that's what would improve longevity at, fr as, uh, from a population perspective. And then healthcare just advances in healthcare would just sort of add to that as well. I mean, to be honest, Jeff, I can go down that rabbit hole with you. I'm I'm a big believer that the farce of our um, food stamp system that allows you to go to McDonald's and buy a Big Mac or go to CVS and buy a candy bar yeah. is ludicrous because those same yes. people, unfortunately, don't have the best health care yeah. and you're not eating well. And then all of a sudden it's like this cycle that feeds into itself. Yeah, it's um, insane. I'm, I'm with you there. We could talk for hours on this kind of thing, obviously, but that will be a conversation we will be having in Miami for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, I want to go back to Bitcoin a little bit and specifically miners. Um, I don't know if you caught this, Mr. Wonderful, uh, Kevin O'Leary the other day talking about sort of his shift in some of the miners he's investing in due to some ESG mandates from above him coming down and saying, we're going to be very strict on what type of companies we want. He started looking into some of these miners uh, and they realized their sort of ESG or claims of being uh, carbon neutral come from buying carbon credits. Um, I don't know what effect or factor that plays into some of your investment strategies or if you're paying attention 
paying attention to it, but would love your thoughts. So I didn't hear that, but I've heard enough of Kevin O'Leary. And first of all, I, I generally like him. I think he's a good, he's very bright I mean, he knows how to make money. I think what he is more than anything, especially in terms of this whole ESG uh, Bitcoin miner movement that he's sort of orchestrating and leading, he's a master marketer, right? He's, he's selling his book. So he's focused on, we are going to do ESG friendly things that society right now thinks is super important. And I have, look at this whole suite of products I have and what I'm investing in, and you can invest in this too. I think he's selling his book. And so um, I, I uh, how do I say this? I'm a big fan of the environment, right? And I, I think Bitcoin is actually very, very net positive for the environment. And so all of these sort of ESG arguments, I think are all misinformed and they're all, and, the, and I think the smart people like Kevin O'Leary who are, who are using these things, are using it for his advantage and they're making the problem worse, not better. And I really wish he would quit doing that because he knows better. And he's, and like I said, he's doing that because he has a, a product offering that will benefit. It's kind of like Peter Schiff talking about all the benefits of gold and how stupid Bitcoin is, but he, uh, he's a gold salesman. He wants people to buy his gold. So of course he's gonna talk the book on gold. That to me is frustrating, uh, and it makes and it makes for because and that's because they have followings. You know, Kevin O'Leary has millions and millions and millions of followers. People who and he's on TV all the time, CNBC and Bloomberg and blah blah blah. So it's frustrating when when he sort of brings the um, ESG narrative to the forefront, even though he knows better and he shouldn't be doing that because it makes the rest of our jobs harder where we have to talk about Bitcoin doesn't waste energy. It uses waste energy. It uses stranded energy. It doesn't steal from the power grids. It's just, it's, it's just not what it does, but he's, he like, he keeps pushing that narrative. And so people keep thinking and like, well, I, if I buy Bitcoin, I want to buy, or if I support miners, I'm only going to buy ones that are, you know, eco-friendly. And, and so like, on the one hand, you're like, well, of course I agree with that. Like I want eco-friendliness. I want the earth to do better, you know? And, but, but this is just so misleading and so disingenuous. It's the same things like Elizabeth Warren says, she's always saying these things that are like, that's not how it is, you know? And like, it's just not true. And then, so we have to spend the rest of our days saying, well, you know, that she, it's a half truth and this is only sort of right. And then this is just a flat out lie. And here's how it really is over here. So that's a really long winded answer to say, I like Kevin O'Leary. I think he's talking his book and it's sort of frustrating and I wish he wouldn't do that. I mean, I don't hate what you're saying. I'm a big believer of, fr frankly, I was taught and fully believe anytime someone goes on CNBC or Fox business to talk about whatever stock they're buying, that's literally them trying to dump shares onto you. <laughs> that is, that is to a T it's right. almost like that to me is a sell signal. Yeah. Every single time I have something in my portfolio and I see a fund manager on, on whatever show say, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm going long on this. And I'm now in a quarter position or I'm yep. in a half position now, yep. but that's just my strategy. Um, I also agree. I personally think the ESG mandates are just bs just to like make you think we're doing something here um my argument always goes back to how much energy does it take to maintain all the atms in america like yeah. just that i don't want the whole banking system right in the new york just how much how much energy goes into maintaining every atm around the country because they run 24 7 right it's, it's exact same thing as a bitcoin miner right so yeah yeah we could go off on examples of that. I, I use Christmas lights as, you know, Christmas was just around, people had lights up. I'm like, you know that uh, Christmas lights actually use more energy than the whole entire Bitcoin network. How do you feel about that? Like, do you think Christmas lights are a necessity? You know, or, well, they're kind of nice, right? And so anyway, so you can go down. I, I like to talk with people about stuff like that, but yeah. I can't knew that. Thank, yeah, yeah. thank you for that. I, I can yeah. always use a new little- uh... There's another one, yeah. So, um. Before we wrap things up, I do want to sort of ask you, um, just if, if you don't mind sharing sort of what your um, maybe end of year outlook is, maybe over the next 18 months, what are you expecting? Where are your expectations at? In terms of like price action, are we talking about? Just on a macro or scale of anything. Macro scale. Yeah. So a macro scale. So um, like I said, I think it's going to get ugly in the second quarter. And so the markets look ahead. So at some point, I think that the markets are going to see, that's why, you know, getting full circle from where we were at the very beginning of this conversation, this is probably a, a little bit of a relief rally before things get darker is how I look at it. And I, I always caveat this with when the facts change, I change. Like I was very bearish 
Um, but I think the facts have changed. And the thing that I think has changed that's a little surprising to me is that inflation is still running hot, like probably as high as it was in December, which was like a 7% uh, print. We may have the January CPI numbers, which come out this week, somewhere right around there. And that may be why that would make sense to me why the different macro, why the different asset classes are moving, how they're moving right now. If the, if the market, if the numbers keep coming in and it starts to become uh, clear that inflation has peaked and is decelerating and GDP, which I think is clear already, is decelerating, second quarter could be really tough for risk on assets. And I still think that includes Bitcoin, even though we all think of it as the ultimate risk off asset, not enough of market participants around the world do agree with that. They think of it as a risk on asset. So they'll sell it and go to cash or they'll sell it and go to long-term US treasuries my opinion. Third quarter, uh, it looks like because we're, we look at year over year comparisons should actually be a reprieve. I actually think that's going to be the best quarter for Bitcoin um, as we kind of look ahead. So, you know, we're talking like June, July ish, somewhere in that kind of time frame. And this is this again, this all changes, but how the market cycles work. Fourth quarter, um, we come back to tough comparisons again, uh, because the fourth quarter we just had, if we just think back to how it was, everybody shot the lights out. It was just a great quarter. GDP was accelerating. Companies did really well. Inflation was super high, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but so we're going to be coming up to those comparisons in the fourth quarter of 2022. It's going to be hard to top those, which kind of, again, means that we're kind of looking for a downtrend in risk on assets. In general, I'm looking at uh, 2022 being kind of a wash for uh, risk on assets. Not a great year for Bitcoin if you want the price to go up. Fantastic year to be buying Bitcoin, right? So stacking sats, use 2022 as probably the last year to get what we consider cheap sats. I think this is the year to do it. I think 2023 is gonna be a bang up year and beyond. And I think then we're just clearly gonna be out of the five digit Bitcoin and into six digits. So 100,000 and above to me are just um, like uh, an almost a certainty uh, in 2022, uh, excuse me, 2023 and beyond. And we're gonna look back and we're gonna, like, can you believe we could buy a Bitcoin for $40,000? That's insane, you know? We're, we're gonna be talking about Bitcoin by then, we're probably talking about just Satoshis like, you know, because because it's going to be too way too big of a number to be talking about Bitcoin, because nobody's going to be able to afford one Bitcoin at that point. So we're going to be talking about ten thousand. How much are ten thousand satoshis worth? You know, or how many? What Mike? A hundred bucks. How many satoshis will that buy? So that's how I'm looking at 2022 stack sats, 2023 and beyond. Fantastic. Love that. And there's one point you brought up that I think is so valid, which is while we may believe Bitcoin to be a risk off asset. The majority of the market participants, and this is not to say the majority of the people, the majority of the dollars invested in Bitcoin do not view it as such. Um, what are, and, and I know we, we've talked at Nogzim about some of these things, but what are maybe some of the things that you're hoping or expecting will help that shift happen to these big money people who don't see it the way we do? So a couple of things I'm looking for. First is that the... Um, to date, the major institutional investors who have got into the Bitcoin space are the traders, the algorithmic traders who manage like big hedge funds, and they're playing the price movements of Bitcoin. They see it as a trade. They see it as a high, highly volatile asset akin to other altcoins. They don't really care what it is. They're just trading it for profit. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of these kind of sideways, choppy price action movements that we're seeing. What I'm waiting to see are is the other institutional investors who are managing billions and billions of dollars who are long only funds. So I think of like pension funds, endowments, these huge things that they're basically long only. They have hundreds of billions of dollars on their balance sheet. And they're like, we are going to put a 5% allocation to Bitcoin and we're never going to sell it. Like their, their ideal holding period, like Warren Buffett, and like I think we should be with Bitcoin is forever. Um, they, they uh, you know, buy well and rarely sell is a, a thing I like to say. So I'm still waiting for those guys to come in. I think we, this is the year we start seeing some of them come in and then that will um, cascade in the coming years. That will put a huge floor under the price of Bitcoin and help at least the, the bottom level of this price channel to just continue to move up and to be very solidified. And then I think what happens is in terms of becoming like this, so that's step one in becoming risk off. Step two is nation state involvement. So what I think, what I would like to see is 
major countries, not just El Salvador, you know, and God bless them. I'm so glad uh, they're doing what they're doing. But other bigger countries start to put um, Bitcoin on their balance sheet as a reserve asset. And I think that's very, I don't, I, not only do I not think that's uh, impossible, I think it's inevitable also. Um, just as gold was the reserve asset in the analog age, Bitcoin is obviously the perfect reserve asset for the digital age. And we are in the digital age now. So as governments transition to that and recognize that, and as you know, a couple of dominoes fall, then they're all going to start doing that. And I tell people like, if I had, if I could put a bug in the ear of, you know, Jerome Powell or whoever else in the government, I'd be like, dude, start doing, if you want your company, excuse me, if you want your currency to survive, start putting Bitcoin on your balance sheet to solidify that. To, they used to do that with gold to strengthen the currency, strengthen the US dollar by buying Bitcoin, strengthen whatever country you're in your currency by buying Bitcoin. If you don't do that, you will go out of existence, I think within a decade. The U.S. Dot, the the best currencies will last probably longer, but tons of small currencies I think are going to get picked off one by one uh, and cease to exist as their as their societies move into Bitcoin. So it'll be a very fun and interesting uh, decade for sure. We're just we're really just getting started, and I yeah. mean, uh, President Bukele keeps teasing that there's a big announcement, and we're we're frankly just running under assumptions here. But mine is that it will be another nation state. Um, to your point, I don't necessarily think it will be like one of the global players, one of the large nations. Um, but I want I want to make sure I clarify this for myself. Your your priority as far as the nation state adoption goes is not make it legal tender. Is not make it oh you like Brazil you can pay taxes for ten percent off, ten percent off. Use code YT Mac for right. Converse tickets, but. It's rather keep it in your reserves. I know so many countries just hold dollars in their reserve, print their own currency on top, but now you're essentially your reserve pool is getting inflated. And then you're also inflating your own currency. So other countries deal it doubly so. So is that sort of where you really want that, that's how, so I want, well, first of all, to be clear, I would love to see both things happen, right? I want it to be legal tender so that like El Salvador, so you can own it legally, not get taxed on it. And you think of it as just, this is just currency. It's just like the US dollar. It's just as, you know, uh, useful. But in order for it to become the world's reserve asset, um, I think that, yeah, I want to see nation states start to actually put it on their balance sheet and not and not do it sort of embarrassingly, but do it like boldly. Like we hold this, look at how sound our currency is now because we hold Bitcoin on our balance sheet. So that day is coming. I hope it comes sooner than later. I hope it's the U.S. that leads the way, although I'm not sure it will be. Um, but who knows? The future is hard to predict and it's uh, it's really hard to predict accurately. Yeah, I mean, you are, you are absolutely right. I mean, look, anyone watching, if you've got that crystal ball, come meet <laughs> Jeff and I in Vegas yeah, right. this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send me an email if you know. That would be good. Uh, Jeff, where can our viewers find you, follow you, learn more about you? Sure. So if you want to learn more about Valeshire and the fun, my, um, the website is just valeshire.com, V-A-I-L-S-H-I-R-E.com. You can uh, email me directly if you want at info at valeshire.com. Uh, if you want to talk about like, you know, uh, portfolio management kind of things and, and how I incorporate Bitcoin into it. And then I'm on Twitter all the time. So my handle on Twitter is at Valeshire cap. Um, find me on there. And I'm always, you know, blathering about something, usually about Bitcoin. Awesome. Well, Dr. Ross, thank you so much for joining us, man. Please feel free to come back anytime. And in the meantime, we are super excited to see you speak at Bitcoin 22. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to chat even more then. Um, so if any of you guys want, make sure you get a ticket, make sure you come out to see uh, Dr. Jeff Ross. If you learn anything here, just wait until you hear an actual prepared speech from the man. <laughs> Yeah, I, I second that. Yep, get your tickets now. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be an incredible conference this year, I think. So come and, come and see all of us. It'll be a lot of fun. Awesome, guys. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll come back, and you'll see my pretty face for a little bit longer.
Welcome back, guys. Uh, that was an incredible conversation with Dr. Jeff Ross. We will absolutely be having him come back onto the show. Um, it really broke down just sort of macro. You know me, I'm the finance Bitcoin adjacent equities guy here for Bitcoin Magazine Live. So getting to talk markets, getting to talk equities and just the global impact of Bitcoin. I had a great time. If you didn't get a chance to catch all of it, feel free to go back. Um, and just again, a reminder, Dr. Jeff Ross will be one of the countless speakers we're going to have, and we're going to continue to have some of these speakers come on to the show in the next couple of months as we lead up to the conference. Make sure you like, subscribe our channel. Make sure you share it with everyone. Uh, we have certain goals that we want to reach, and if we reach them, you get the benefit of SATs. So keep an eye out on that. Um, I don't know if... I've said this story to a point where you guys are sick of it, but I want to really, really emphasize one day in particular of the conference, and that is Industry Day. Um, for those of you who, like me a year ago, were not working in Bitcoin, were not involved in this really community or in this space, but aspire to and want to work in Bitcoin, Industry Day is literally just a day where every company that is advertising or a partner of the Bitcoin conference is shilling the job openings that they have. And this ranges from programmer type jobs to sales type jobs. Heck, here at Bitcoin Magazine, we're hiring someone to work in HR. This is very much like there is any job available for Bitcoiners if you're willing to work and if you're willing to, to learn more. So please make sure if, if this is something you want to do, take the time to invest in, in buying an industry pass. Heck, if it's only one day, fine. If you can only manage it, come for just that day, just so you can help set yourself up, set your career up on the right foot. Um, I will continue to pound that drum. I want to see more people involved in Bitcoin, both working, both investing, and just out there preaching the good word of Bitcoin. Um, we like to joke sometimes that it's a, a religion and a cult, but you know, once once you go down this rabbit hole, there's no coming out of it. And all you want to do is, is help all your friends and family uh, go down the rabbit hole as well. Um, shout out though, really quickly, we, we did talk a little bit about this with, with Jeff, but just the idea of, you know, holding your Bitcoin through the downturns as well as the upswings. Um, you know, I definitely orange pilled my mom, maybe at a wrong time because her, a lot of her buys are at around $50,000. Um, and she doesn't know how to sell her Bitcoin. So she's going to hold maybe not by choice, but that's, that's the case. And I keep reminding her, you're not holding this for you. You're not holding this for me. You're holding this for the grandchildren that you want that may or may not happen eventually. <laughs> um, use code YTMAG, get 10% off. I do also want to highlight something really cool that uh, both myself and my producer, Chris, will be putting on after this show. If you guys want to hop on over to Twitter at a in about 40 minutes, so 4 p.m. Eastern time, we'll be hosting a Twitter Spaces that's going to talk specifically about uh, the trucker convoy. We have the brain trust of Greg Foss. We have Jeff Booth, BTC Sessions, and countless other Canadian Bitcoiners talking about what they're seeing, uh, updates, their, their speeches going on in Ottawa right now. Um, we'll be sharing footage of that in the coming episodes and next, going into next week as well. Uh, but if you want to be a part of that conversation, feel free to hop on over to Twitter. Uh, make sure you give both Chris and myself a follow in the meantime. Uh, we're, we're trying to have a little internal competition of who can get the most followers by conference day. Chris has a 600 follower lead on me, so I could use some help, guys. Um, but I think that's, uh, that's our episode for today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and joining us. I hope you guys were able to learn a little bit. And we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, we got an exciting guest and we'll be posting about it on the video, Bitcoin Magazine's video account. If you have questions that you want to post ahead of time, feel free to, to comment under that post when you see it later tonight. In the meantime, we'll see you over on Twitter and Twitter spaces. Thank you all.